for YouTube, feel free. I think this should be available to as many people as possible. Hello, everybody who's coming on. We're so happy you're here. Um, this is going to be my intention is this going to be dynamic, meaning it's not just going to be a, a, a real, a raw and real discussion between, you know, all of the speakers, which I hope it will be, but also with your questions, you know, if, if it's not real, it's not worth anything, like all of it, you know, it, it's, that's all of it. Okay. So let me Shifra, just, quickly... Shifra, well, let me yes. just ask you, if you want yes. us to stream, I think you need to give us permission. Ah, David, how does that happen? Thank I don't you know that I can do that. Hang on. I wish we could stream on YouTube and Facebook at the same time, but we can't with Zoom. We can only choose one because then people could share. I don't but I don't think I can I can give permission to stream. I think that's Zoom just lets me stream. Um Okay, so you're streaming on YouTube, right? Right. Okay, so we'll we can link to it later. Okay. Okay, that that works too. All right. So I want to quickly introduce everybody. I'm not going to read a whole bio, but just in case some people here do not know um, any or or at least some of the speakers, I just want to give you a quick nutshell version of who is here with us today. Rabbi, in no particular order, <laughs> Rabbi Abraham Sutton is a spiritual mentor, teacher, and author who's been learning and teaching prophetic Torah and Kabbalah for over 40 years. He has translated, edited, and authored over 30 major works, major Torah works in English on the deeper significance of Torah for our age, which he calls the age of spiritual awakening. I'm sure nobody's gonna argue with that. So thank you, Rabbi Sutton, for joining us. Um, Rabbi Simon Jacobson is the author of the best-selling book. You can find out, by the way, more about each of these speakers on the, on the same page that you're linking to um, to get the Zoom. We have full bios there. So Rabbi Simon Jacobson is the author of the best-selling book toward a meaningful life and the head of the Meaningful Life Center, which really is a transformative center and a transformative book, bringing the wisdom of the Lubavitcher Rebbe in, in application, as Rabbi Jacobson says, to psycho-spiritual issues for people of all backgrounds. For over 14 years, he was also the editor-in-chief of Vad Hanacha Satmimim. So as such, he was responsible for downloading... Um, the, during live speeches of the Rebbe, compiling, editing, and publishing those talks. And he worked closely with the Rebbe. So, um, you know, a lot of wisdom that might not be, and, and information that might not be so readily accessible. Sitting right here with us, Rabbi Ruven Wolf is a shaliach, an emissary of the Lubavitcher Rebbe in Los Angeles. He, he runs a Torah learning center, Mayan Yisrael, which exists to fulfill the vision of spreading these profound mystical teachings of what he calls Hasidic Judaism. I sometimes call it the mystical Torah and the reality of the Geula, the messianic redemption, also to people of all backgrounds worldwide. And Ani, I see that you're, do you wanna be called Kana, Ani? I, I don't know, people know me as Ani already, so you can just okay. introduce me so, as Ani here. Ani also Hannah Lipitz is a speaker, yeah. teacher, mashpia, um, a spiritual mentor, in other words, and a writer. And all of her work centers around helping herself and others deeply understand, connect to, and live this transformation that is part of the redemption process, Geula. She also runs Geula Vision um, at uh, her, own web, her own website and WhatsApp group. She's a principal of the Hey Haldivara High School and Women's Space Medrash and is the author of The Tanya Companion. So that's who we have sitting in front. That's just the outer little nutshell version of have, who we have sitting with us today. And of course, our unbelievable soul tribe. And I love the way I didn't, you know, you guys are just introducing yourselves. I, um, I did get some feedback, first of all, from a lot of people. Everyone, everyone here was, was heavily requested by listeners for a return appearance. And um, we couldn't have everybody back, but these were some of the very top votes. And there's a reason for that. And and I wanna just say that the, some of the questions, the most primary predominant questions that people have asked me so far for everybody here are around how do we live this in our everyday? What can we do to help? What can we do if we're not Jewish? And also what can we do if we're Jewish? And also things like, um, you know, what are the primary tools to get rid of fear and and whatever else that people are going through? So I want to get to those. And mostly I want to get to a space where everybody can share your questions, your insights. We're creating something that's real. I keep using that word because it's so deeply meaningful to me. We are together for a reason. 
and we're together on the cutting edge because we're learning the Torah of redemption. So anybody who's here right now is part of that, creating new channels. So just bring yourself, bring your questions, bring everything that you have. Um, I'm sure all the speakers will have a chance to look at the chat because not everybody's speaking at once. Can you listen to the summit on Tisha B'Av? Yes. Um, I left it up. I'm leaving everything up on purpose because this is the time when we really want to get the get all that of that. That was a halakha question. Oh, halakha question. Okay, rabbis, can they listen to this on Tisha B'Av? Didn't even think about that. I don't have a beard, but after Chatzais. Okay. <laughs> Our first halakhic answer. Does everybody agree with that? After midday? Certainly after after midday, one o'clock, one thirty, there's a there's a the ruach, the spirit changes and it becomes much lighter, and especially three, four, five, six o'clock. You can sit on chairs, you can and you can talk about Mashiach in a way that you can't do it during the morning hours. Okay, great. Any other, anybody else want to weigh in? Maybe so, first we should find out what we're going to say before we become <laughs> another kid. Yeah, good point. They're asking about all the summit recordings, though. Um, yeah, anyway, so if anybody wants to weigh in on that later on, that would be great. So I, so just inviting everybody to participate, everybody to interact as honestly as you can. Um, and any questions, any insights, anything that you want to say to make this real and applicable for you. I'm going to start out by asking a few questions that I sat with and just whoever wants to speak to it. But, uh, just to, uh, And I do want to say one more thing first. It's like there's a this is a double edged sword. It's ridiculous to invite this many people with this caliber of <laughs> essential divine wisdom and experience in this process. It, to be in a, you know, in a session, even if it's, you know, I'm, as we have done in the past between two and three hours. On the other hand, it's a unique opportunity as everybody's perspective together creates like a diamond or what sometimes I call triangulation, where we can see things in a much more holistic way, a nonlinear way, and, and also interacting with everybody here. So I apologize in advance to each of you amazing speakers. Thank, thank you so much for agreeing to be with us and knowing that it's a panel. So I'll try to make sure, and please feel free to jump in. You know, nobody should sit and feel like I want to say something and I can't just feel free to just, it's, I want it raw and real. And I'm sure everybody else does too. Okay, so my first question for whoever wants to jump in is what do you personally see as the greatest challenge of these times? And also what do you see as the most exciting potential? And I'm speaking to you as not just mentors and teachers, but as actual human beings who are going through this. Anybody, should I call on somebody? Just talk. All right, I see smiles. All right, Rabbi Sutton, I'm calling on you. <laughs> there's a personal and there's a collective level that um, really actually reflect, it, reflect one another. The inner struggle of a person who's trying to be honest and in trying to live according to a higher truth, which is important to, to look into. What is that? How do we do that? Rabbi Jacobson dealt with that when he spoke last week. Um, the struggle in our individual lives is very important. The struggle in the collective is very heavy right now. There are forces that want to cover the earth with darkness. Isaiah said, um, the earth will be covered with darkness and the peoples of the earth with a thick darkness, a fog. Now, the earth is, earth life right now is a little bit dark, but people's minds, right, are even more, or even darker. So there's a force that's trying to cover to take over. The light is very great. And those of us who connect to it and know it and believe it and know that Hashem has built this up for millennia to come to this point. But we've been told the very end will be a, will be a, a struggle mm. for people's minds, for people's spirit, for what is, is true freedom and not false freedom and not think I can do whatever I want. Because a body-based life, there's no meaning anymore to human existence. And that's what certain 
powers think they can do is control people's lives. Hashem is all life, pro-life, pro-choice in the true sense of the word. All the, all the expressions have been distorted and contorted so that nothing has any meaning. Right and left is even has, is meaningless. So there's huge stuff going on on the planetary level, on the millennial level, moving into the Messianic age. That's exactly when the Nachash, the serpent, came into the picture in the Garden of Eden is at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, according to different sources, but basically noon. And history came to 12 o'clock Friday afternoon of history in 1990. I can show you the background for how to get that, but um, that's when the real showdown started. <laughs> <laughs> when the forces of darkness said, we're going to step forward and try and take over completely. And we're going to set in, plan, set in place a plan that's going to, in, that's going to take over mankind from inside because they're weak. They have no moral background. People are weak. But the moral background that we're finding now that's coming to the fore is as a result of these people trying to take over. So this incredible pushback. Pressing I'll stop diamond. here. Anybody wants to say anything? But this, this is this is the level. This is the level that I see things going on at. Uh, that's awesome. We said raw and real. So obviously, the greatest the challenge you let you laid out as dark forces and the nachash and the snake, primordial snake, and that energy and the, the and the the most exciting thing is what's unfolding beneath and the potentials that are coming out of through that process. Is that correct? In a, basically summing up great thank you who else next <laughs> okay rabbi jacobson you want to chime in most uh, or, most sorry. biggest challenge most exciting potential that you see personally and experience personally sure so first of all shifra thank you for having me and i want to uh, acknowledge and uh, be honored to be with my co-panelists here uh it's great to be all together talking about these uh, important, vital matters of actually the present and the future. So uh, my perspective on a personal note, um, I'm not going to say that I disagree, but I actually see things a different, little differently. Um, there are, in uh, Kabbalistic teachings, we talk about forces of evil, uh, like a serpent, or, uh, or uh, the head of the serpent or other expressions that talk about Amalek or other um, negative powers that come from the Klippa and Sitra Akhra, which means from the shells, from the husks and from the other side. But then there's another challenge, which I think is the real one, not forces of evil, but rather ignorance that is an absence of light it's very different, for example, when you talk about um, the concept that someone is a wicked person, a Russia, a cruel, wicked person, or somebody is considered to be a Tinuk Shanishba, for instance, which means a child that was born into captivity, and they don't know better. It's one thing someone knows what Shabbos is, what kosher is, what God is, what Mashiach is, for that matter, and they reject it, than another that doesn't even know what it is in the first place. Very different reality. To the outside uh, untrained eye, it may look similar because both are living in a dark state, but one is actual force of darkness and one is simply an absence of light. So how I would categorize our time is actually a time of uh, tremendous, uh, tremendous material success. The very fact that we have these technologies, we have medical advances, the longevity, life expectancy, and so many other so much other progress. On the other hand, on a psychological, spiritual, and emotional level, we're probably more bankrupt than ever. And maybe they're even interdependent um, because when you have all these material successes and you don't keep up with spiritual, uh, the spiritual pace, it creates quite a dichotomy. And how, that's how I would categorize it. I find that there aren't necessarily forces of evil. I find there are forces of ignorance and absence that simply don't know. When you're not educated, you're not taught, 
um, it's, it's obvious that the status quo is going, you're going to gravitate to whatever comes your way or whatever the media or other peers uh, influence you. And that's, uh, I think, our, both our great challenge and our great opportunity. And it all lies in the same thing. Whenever there's pr prosperity and success, it will always lead to apathy unless you fight it. And that's what we're dealing with, the apathy and ignorance, and at the same time, tremendous opportunity. I mean, it couldn't be set up better. You talk about Geula and redemption is exactly what you need because it's like a combustion chamber. All, the, all you need is to light the sparks. You don't have real forces of, of an enemies. You have ignorance. You have absence of things. And if you do that, especially with technology today, you can literally affect and transform a critical mass in seconds. So the words of Isaiah, that there will be no more evil and destruction in the world because the world will be filled with divine knowledge as the waters cover the sea. He said it as a visionary, as a prophet. Today, it's, it doesn't require faith. It's a press of a button. We're sitting right now on a Zoom, on a YouTube, on technology, and being able to potentially reach uh, 8 billion people. I don't know if they're all listening right now, but they could, potentially, they could potentially be listening. That is an opportunity that unprecedented. <clears throat> Our ancestors would see this as completely messianic. On the other hand, we also have plenty of information that's useless and worse than that and destructive that's also being disseminated. But again, I have no doubt in the words of uh, King Solomon, when he says in the book of Ecclesiastes that, that really I see the virtue, the quality of wisdom is more powerful than folly, like the power of light over darkness. Light and darkness, interestingly, are not like fire and water that are two adversarial forces that can nullify each other. Enough water can uh, extinguish the great fire can, can, and then enough fire can evaporate great bodies of water. Light automatically, without any effort, dispels even a little darkness. So we need to be the bearers of light, the bearers of this message, understanding that we are literally at the threshold of a new beginning, a new era, a new world, a new spiritual, uh, if you talk about the agricultural, and then the, tech, and then the industrial, and then the information revolution, that we're on the verge of a spiritual revolution. And it takes people like you and I, grassroots that simply connect like we're doing right now, kindred spirits, and we, we, that light will dispel any of the darker forces that are out there. If there, yeah, the light reaches, yeah, I don't see a contradiction at all, by the way, in what we've heard so far. Uh, what's coming to my mind is that idea that, that um, about demons being able to invade an empty space, but not where there's a population. So I think what you're saying, Rabbi Jacobson is also what Rabbi Sutton is saying. There, there, there are ideas. There is apathy. There are, you know, from my perspective, at least, governmental forces, corporate forces. There are, you know, there. It's always been that there are forces starting with Nimrod, maybe, or others. But there's always been this counter force to people. But I think it's. I think that what I hear you saying is it's not real anymore. It doesn't have to take. It doesn't have actual force except in the absence of light. And I think that that, yeah, that resonates a lot. Rabbi Wolf. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me on again. Um, okay. So the challenge, the challenge, you know, I, 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 I can hear what was said earlier and, and identify with both of what was been saying has been said, um, you know, if I would phrase it, it, it would be the challenge of being able to live from a far, from a panemiastic place. Panemius means from a very, from an internal place, as opposed to um, getting, seeing and taking and, and forming your worldview and your whole uh, sense of reality from, from the chitzainias, from the external. You know, what we mentioned earlier, the unholy that exists in the world is called klipa. Klippa means it's an external shell. Now, the, the, you know, and, and then in the Hasidic and in Kabbalistic terminology, we always talk about the separation of, of good and bad and so on and so forth. It's a process since the chet, since the sin of the tree of knowledge, where there was a mixture and when things are, are separated. So it's true that there's still tiny little debris of, of, le, of, of you know, what is being spit out. And that might be uglier that because, because there's no more uh, uh, life in it, because there's no more 
truth in it because there's nothing godly in it. So it comes out to become so empty, but really, really nasty looking and really ugly looking. And the problem is that because we have such a open, all the tools that we have, because we grab our phones the first thing in the morning, which we shouldn't be doing, we should first spend an hour or two connecting to Hashem and then, and then only then and connecting to a deeper consciousness and a deeper self. And then if we have to deal with the world to know what's going on and so how to be able to influence it, then we're coming from a whole different place. The problem is that people are so dependent today. And I, I say myself as well, we immediately, you know, grab onto these devices and we allow everything to be told to us from the outside. And, and, and we get caught up in this, in what might, instead of realizing that this is just a tiny little fragment of an external shell that has no life to it anymore. And it's just you know, saying goodbye. And because it's saying goodbye, it's making it stamping its feet and it's making a lot of noise, but it's not real. What's real is the Torah and mitzvahs, the, 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 the Torah and the mitzvot and the godliness that we brought into the world for thousands of years. And that's the truth in the world. And that's our truth. And that's why mankind is so hungry for, as Rabbi Jacobson said, for a little bit of light. It's just as a matter of ignorance. And people, people so quickly, when you give them a little truth, when you give them a little emes, when you give them a little oyer, uh, you know, they it's 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 connected to, and everything else is, is it suddenly becomes so so superficial, so empty, and so meaningless. It's just when people don't have something deeper. I would say the second challenge for myself, and this probably goes uh, along with this, is to realize that every single one of us that is on this call, the fact that you're on this call, and I say myself as well because I'm also on the call is that you are sensitive to the fact that we're at the cusp and we're not just at the cusp, but we're literally at this trans transformational time. And the fact that we recognize it, understand it and appreciate it makes us, the Rebbe would say to each and every one of us, each and every one of us is responsible to bring this to the rest of the world. And for me personally, I struggle with the fact that, that I sometimes think I'm so small and insignificant and play a little, a tiny little, okay, so what, so you know, Shifra Khanna had me on and this one had, you know, and I came here and I said things, but no, 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 there's so much that, that I can share and others can share and we need to share and teach and inspire and reach. And we should think much bigger than we're thinking. We should think about the millions and, and people that we could reach and should reach and, and stop thinking small. And that becomes that every single person that's here has that responsibility to, 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 to recognize. And it's not ego. It's not about self. It's about being the divine channel which Hashem has has you know picked us and put us at this time and age, and get whichever talent we have, whether it's speaking, communicating through writing, or even the ability to organize events and share them with others, these things are so important, and we have to constantly re remember how important we are. The most important, most pivotal moment in all of existence, because we were planted at this point of transformation. My thoughts. Yeah, thank you. And uh, soon I'm going to want to ask people to speak about somebody else. Just ask now, how do we do that as a regular person? I want to hear from Ani. Um, and yeah, and also I just want to say that Rabbi Jacobson at the end of the interview that we did for this summit said, <laughs> I didn't get to ask him much about it yet, but that he wants to reach, he intends to reach, I think you said 1.8 billion people, 20% of the global population. So I'm, <laughs> I'm wondering what the plan is and how we can get how we can get involved. Um, so let's get to that next. Ani, what do you have to say? The most, the biggest challenge, most exciting opportunity. That sure, I think it's over. for me personally, it's one and the same. And this is something that I think each of us individually and, and collectively are, if we haven't already consciously started into this particular aspect of it, we certainly will soon, which is figuring out how to navigate in a Google reality when all of my programming is around how to be good and accomplish and succeed in a gullis or in an exile reality where there is a constant battle going on between the physicality and the spirituality between light and, and dark. And even throughout history, even tension and conflict between Jews and non-Jews that the Rebbe said that we've now entered the era of the Gula. We were here and our job one of the biggest things that we can do to help that process along in its manifestation is to live in a Google way. And so this means living in a truly integrated way and learning, like for me personally, figuring out how do I still feel good and worthy? And like, I'm doing my task list. I'm doing my mission, what I'm here to do. If it's no longer just about checking the box, Shabbos check, did, you know, learned check, sneeze check, hair covered check, but now I have to go down into my tachtonin, into my depths, 
and encounter all of these forces in me, my emotions, my heart, the stuff I've been carrying with me through this lifetime, all of these things that want to be seen, that's no longer just about my behavioral performance, but about like who I am. And I have to go deep and confront myself. And, and we have to actually, when we're learning Tara, especially to sit and especially the Rebbe's Tara now, we have to learn it much more deeply and more subtly to find the guidance and how to do that and how to meet these parts of ourselves and bring them on board as well. So for me, that's been the biggest challenge is saying, how do I still feel worthy and aligned and centered when I'm going deep to meet all these parts of myself to integrate them and, and unleash this power, which thank God I've, you know, when, when you first start doing so being like, I don't have to have an adverse an adversarial relationship with physicality anymore it can actually maybe even enhance my relationship with God. And you first start doing that and you're like, oh my gosh, am I going to get pulled, you know, off the path? Am I going to get pulled off center? And my experience, I've been now on this path consciously for the past four years, I've only become, you know, like firmer, like I've only become more sensitive to, to halacha and being in alignment and, and, and beautifying my practice of Torah and mitzvahs. So thank God I'm living proof that it's only if you're doing the spirituality, right? It should enhance your relationship with physicality. And if you're doing the physicality, right, it should enhance your relationship with spirituality. And that's what it is to be in this integrated reality. But we have to totally un, we have to totally undo in some ways, this old paradigm of what makes me good and worthy in the world as a, as somebody who's trying to serve God. Um, it's, it's different now. The rules of engagement changed. And I'm not saying that only a tzaddik can say that. And, you know, the Rebbe said that. So, yeah, this actually leads me to the one other question that I had written down besides the one about what do we do, which is very much in the minds, obviously, of the audience generally and specifically. Um, so my, the, the second general question that I had and have is what is this metamorphosis that um, we are going through as human beings. Obviously, we're not meant to stay stuck in the what we call the human condition, but we've been stuck in it for basically since the beginning of the exile from the garden. So what is the shift that's occurring on that level? How do we facilitate it? And then I, what I also want to ask everybody, is I, I do ask people this a lot, but I want to ask the speakers and also the audience, what kind of shifts of your very your of what it means to you to be human um in this metamorphosis what kind of shifts if any have you experienced like i you know often i often i hear from people experiencing deeper percep deeper perceptions deeper intuition a, a much more tangible sense of god's presence and many many other things which i also experience so i'd love to hear on that level let's make it like again, as real as possible. And I can, we can go in this order that, you know, randomly got established or people, you guys, you could jump in. If you feel passionate about answering something, answer it. Two people talk at once and one will stop. We don't have to be so polite. You're wondering about specific shifts that I've seen. Yeah. All right. Let's start with you. Yeah. That all right. Since I, since I that what is yeah. the, two, what is the, I think of this as a metamorphosis a lot. Yeah. Absolutely. Metamorphosis is very, it's huge. It's not, I mean, it's also, it's described as a birth process. That's also huge, but it's huge. A metamorphosis is hu a huge on a much deeper level because it's literally the same creature showing up in an entirely different way, mm -hmm. a way that for the caterpillar, you know, looking down on the ground with little feet eating leaves is never going to be imaginable. But it seems like that's the minimum of the change that's that's that we're being ushered through or helping to facilitate. So, mm -hmm. I just want to know from you what you what you how you see that and where what where you're experiencing so far. Like where where is that metamorphosis happening in you? If you're willing, anybody who's willing yeah. to share. Um, yeah, I'll just go. I'll just go quickly because I've spoken about this with you before, even even publicly on on the summits. Um, I mean, it's really about receiving a higher vision from from our own Pnei Mashiach, the spark of Mashiach within us, learning how to receive those desires and those visions of what does my life look like in a redeemed state? And that's, that's not like I'm living on a castle with, you know, on a mountain made of ice cream. It might be for you. It's not for me, but it might be for you. But it, it looks very mundane sometimes because that's the Rebetah and that's God being revealed in the human details of our life. You know, I, it might look like I have better relationships with my kids. It might look like I have a nicer house. I. I have the ability to honor my desire 
my my desires enough to say like I'm gonna buy myself a new couch because it would just make me happy you know things like that so but being aware that we may have a huge vision like part of I have those very mundane visions as well and then I have you know my huge sleeping vision of totally revolutionizing education and opening my school and doing that but I'll just tell you like you know on a very personal level as I realized I have access now to these much deeper, higher parts of myself, because the Hasidus tells me I do, that I can tap into my own spark of Mashiach, the, the, you know, the, the crown, the essence of my own soul and receive from there now. Um, I started taking that serious, very seriously. And, um, you know, I've said this a lot of times, like I was total people pleaser, total fawner, my trauma response is fawning. I needed to erase myself. I couldn't have an opinion. Can't handle anybody being the slightest bit upset with me for any reason. Um, and as I plugged into this redemption reality, my 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 human psyche, my nefesh Bahamas, my express per human personality did a total 180. And literally, like my mission is, I'm a public speaker, and I and I get up there and I say a lot of things that a lot of people may not want to hear or like to hear, and I challenge the status quo, and I don't care anymore. And so I've literally seen within myself, it's been painful. There's been a lot of pain in it, but a massive healing and expanding of literally my human personality, my Nefesh Bahamas, my human psyche has done a total 180 and I feel in my power. And for me, that's been a very tangible, real experience and Gula vision, the school, just every in my, in my life, being able to show up as a better mother, the mother that I want to be, who's able to hold space for my kids and all their stuff and the wife that I want to be, all of that came from plugging into, oh my gosh, the re if the redeemed reality is available to me and it's on me to plug into that, I've seen the results, thank God, in every aspect of my being. Mm. Wow. Okay. Who else? Rabbi Sutton, you're nodding. Rabbi Wolf is leaning forward. Jump in somebody. What's your experience and your thoughts on this? I'll jump in. Okay. Great. Um, so secondly, very moving, and that was very beautiful to hear. Thank you for sharing that, both on a personal note and as well as some sure help others in their own context. I would frame it a bit like this based on my own personal experiences. <clears throat> Now, psychologically speaking, what I find is that fear and insecurity drives most people. Sometimes there are known fears and known insecurities. Known. Just the inability or not having the courage to just be yourself, either, as was just mentioned, due to being judged or being criticized or being silenced and not allowed to speak up, um, having to become a pleaser or a fawner to satisfy someone's expectations, whatever the reasons are, and there are many usual suspects when it comes to this, but bottom line is fear and insecurity drives many, many people. And as a result, um, as a result, what it causes is all kinds of symptoms that don't allow people to be their true selves. So to put it in more mystical terms, when God created the universe, pre-tree of knowledge, there was a certain seamlessness between human consciousness and divine consciousness. It was aligned. Think of a machine that's working perfectly aligned to the intentions and the plans of its engineer. So that's called being healthy physically and spiritually. But as soon as dissonance was born, where there was some form of separation between the divine plan, your purpose, who you are and what you do between your own independent consciousness and ego and the divine consciousness, that's where fears and insecurities come into play. In the words of uh, the Arizal, the great Simpson, the concealment of the divine, allowing space for another independent consciousness with the objective that they join and fuse. But if they separate, you call that gullus mentality. The word gallus really means displacement. Just mm. like the word avera doesn't mean a sin, it means a displacement. You're misaligned. And mitzvah, gaula consciousness, is realigning and crossing over that dissonance. So I find that the great opportunity and challenge, as we've been discussing, is that 
instead of succumbing to your fears and insecurities, and instead of even fighting your fears, whether it's through therapy or medication or other things we do to numb ourselves, the best and most important thing is the best defense is offense. The Geula mentality is that you, you have something unique to contribute. And as when you influence others, you're less influenced by them because it works one way, it works one way or another. Either you're yes. absorbing others or you're exuding. And today we have the opportunity to be those agents and ambassadors and agents of the divine of light. And as soon as you find what you're good at, that's what you focus on. Help one person, say one kind word, create a gu'ula mentality in your personal life. And that's the best way to dispel the fears, the insecurities, the inhibitions, and all the other psychological traps and, um, and trappings that inhibit and don't allow us to really be ourselves. You know, it's really to discover that you're in a shama the morning you say, Moida'ani, thank you for returning my soul to me. And then you say, What? My soul that you've given me, Tahora, is pure. Recognize the beauty and the purity of who you truly are is the best way to fight the demons and the darkness and all those uh, shadowy, the voices of the shadows that can haunt us so much. And if you can spark that, find some, one good thing to do. You like music? Play music. Sing a song. Share a kind word with someone. Send a message. Use social media or technology to share light and warmth and inspiration. These, these, these proactive forces, this proactive behavior, that's gu'ula thinking and that's neshama thinking as opposed to the displaced and dissonant voice of gullus and the, and the displacement that that represents. That to me is the key to the to the formula that if we can package that and replicate that and help people each in their own individual lives, it doesn't have to be dramatic, just one shift from the being from defense to offense, one shift that you have something to give and that you don't need to be afraid of someone in someone's demands that can change everything from in your personal life, from personal uh, displacement to a personal redemption. And ultimately that leads to the global and the cosmic redemption. Yeah, that's really well said. Thank you. Some people are asking what's exuding and what's absorbing. It's just like my husband says, you're either on transmit or receive. So we want to, we want to get connected with what's meant to be transmitted, like, you know, part of God's army, so to speak. And and stop receiving that will I'll just use the words my father always as a journalist okay. my father would always say there, there there are people who make things happen people who watch things happen and people who ask what happened so it simply comes down to are you going to be sitting and absorbing other people's information and media and being inundated by by all that's out there or are you going to be transmitting that's a good way to put it be giving giving off your light your uniqueness yeah, every time I've uh, every time in my life so far, and I mean over the past decades, when I've actually decided to do something that you know, whether it was signing up people and to have a letter in a Sefer Torah, you know, the Rebbe's long ago campaign, or that was the first thing I ever got involved in. Whatever it is, when you're part of the, the when you're part of the prophetic reality emerging even again it's true even if it's something individual and small we're none of there 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 are almost eight billion of us for a reason because everybody has a everybody's a cell in this body in this collective but it really it shuts off the ability of all those outside messages to get under your skin and hurt you and shut you down with fear it really does work like that like if you turn the faucet on you know air is not going to go in because water's coming out so yeah thank you very much for that perspective um Okay, Rabbi Wolf. If you want to pass, you could pass me. It's, it is, no, it, it, I like. I, it's 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 special. We're here together. Um, um, I, I like to hear, particularly, the perspective from from Ani in terms of from perspective from women, because you know, as someone who teaches Hasidus for so many years, you know, there's always the, I, I know it from my students and I've been teaching particularly in girls' schools and, mm. and, and everything is, is, is so, so much not about the idea, but about my life and my practical living. I sometimes feel that I'm lagging behind when it comes, because I get excited about the ideas. They're awesome, they're exciting, they're stuff. But then the question becomes, how about me and my personal living every day? 
uh, women are the bina that takes it down into the details. So when it comes to these things, it's like, yeah, so how does it work when you drink your coffee in your morning? And how does it work when you, when you, when you do your exercise? And how, do you, how does it work just physically you know, in your, in your day-to-day schedule? I think the women have to take the leading role in that. They really do, because, because it's, 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 you know, when it comes you know, to, 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 to ideas, to big ideas, it's one thing. But when it comes to, 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 to the actual implementation, it's very special to hear. Um, I, I would say a, a certain switch, the switching in our own heads of the, of the understanding that, um, you know, in Hasidus, we've, we, 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 there's the old school of thinking that we've been talking about. There's the old school of thinking. And the, and the old school is one that, and when I say the old school, I mean a wholly old school, but still the way things were before we, before we entered into this, this Mashiach age, which as Rabbi Sutton said, 1990, that was a major, major transition point because that's Chatzais. That's already Arab Shabbos. That's like midday of Shabbos beginning to come. So the understanding that we are now living in a reality in which things are becoming godlier and godlier and godlier every second. And that includes my physical body. And that mm-hmm. includes my, the, the physical world around me. So the, 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 the notion or the idea, the old school is that you learn even in the Hasidic, in the Tanya, the more a person engaged in physicality, the more dull and, 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 and desensitized you become to spirituality and to holiness. And that was true about the physical existence before it comes the time of the after the Birer. But once we reached already the point when the Rebbe said, we finished Avoid Sabiru, and we have to be careful with this, doesn't mean, God forbid, that the physical, you know, one gets a license to for indulgence. But on a deep level, the appreciation, understanding that my struggle that I have within my own things that are not godly should be easier today than it was yesterday. And it should be, in other words, Every day that we're going more and more and more into Friday, into the end of Friday, and getting closer to Shabbos, the very nature of existence is making it. So if I tried yesterday to be Mashiach Tig and it didn't work so well, today I have much greater ability and a much greater chance to be even more successful than I was yesterday, and tomorrow even more. And the, and the, and the, and the, but in, in, in our heads from the Gullus world that we have from the past, we're still in this sometimes in the in the situation. Well, oh, I'm only I'm only worse where I was. I'm only lower than where I was, and that's a that's a switch that has to be made. And that's what I work on. It's only getting godlier. It's only getting holier. And my body is waiting for me. My 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 body is waiting for my neshama to acknowledge how godly the body is and how in sync my body could be with the Abishter and with Torah and Mitzvahs because of the godly state that we're in. Wow, wow. Okay, Rabbi Sutton. I need time to process all this. I'm coming from a very different place. I mean, I, I, res- I respect all that's being said, and there's so much to be said. There's a very great light shining, and there are also, it's known that just before the end, the forces of darkness will try all they can to stop it, but Hashem sends his light down from the future is giving us the ability to go through this. So it's, this is, again, this is a different way of looking at things and I'm not interested in any arguments, but it's a different it's point a world of view that I have, the world view that I have from my teachers, from my svarim. I have uh, a large, wide base of learning. I work with Tehillim a lot, David Melech, King David, struggle a lot with, with forces of darkness. It's not, um, it's, it's it, Hashem, in, in terms of monotheism, it's God up here and man against the devil. It's not God against the devil. It's, a, it's Hashem created a force that, that we have to fight against and grow by fighting against it. We grow by the friction that we, that we encounter with that which is antithetical to who we are. It, it, it poses a, 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 a tremendous challenge to us. And our, and our response to that challenge allows us to do things and to come to places that we never, we never could have come to without those challenges. So that's where I'm coming from. It's slightly different. There's a lot to say for every, everything and everybody's saying here, but it's, it's, it's something that needs to be developed and, and understood, a whole worldview. 
it that's is it's all it's all part of the same process because i know yeah. what your what your um you know your your book spiritual technology by the way it was a big impact on me um but for i mean for me personally the transformation that i've gone through personally understanding that the redeemed reality was here there was immense struggle within myself these forces of darkness as they had invaded me and and position themselves in my psyche as opponents. The Sutton literally means opponents, but you know, voices of other people who had been very toxic forces in my life, abusive forces in my life, coming up against you think you think that this is real. You think all this is real. You you think you're not actually just this pathetic little whatever. Like you think you deserve any of this. This is really who you are. What do you think you're doing? And it's not this like it's not this like little struggle of like, oh, the little stock puppet voices. It's a horrific existential experience and darkness that as you push through it and you say like, no, I'm going to grab onto this light. I'm going to grab onto the words of the Tara that tell me what the reality is. It, it is an existential experience, at least for me and for many other, you know, women and men that I know who've been in this process of your, your guts turning inside out. And so it is, as we're working to grasp the light and the Gula reality, there are these forces of darkness that are coming out of the woodworks um, but you know, we know right from Tanya that in the end, these forces of darkness, their own deepest will is to be overcome. And they're actually rooting for us to overcome them, but they do their job really well. They do their job really well. And, um, and I, my personal theory is that we're right now witnessing when, when God says, and I will remove the, the spirit of impurity from the world, it's got to get pushed out for everybody to see and recognize for what it is. It can't stay infesting the woodworks. It has to actually get pushed out. And because all of these spiritual things, the prophecies, they all play out in our world as we know it, in our psychological, sociological structures as we know them, it's real. It's literally real. And it's playing out before our eyes. So I think that these forces of darkness, it's we're literally seeing them being pushed out to be cleansed from the world. I really appreciate what you're saying. There's an there's a white elephant in the room. It's not just a vague thing called forces of darkness and forces of evil. People are trying to take over our lives. People are trying to take over the lives in the Netherlands, in France, and in Britain, and in Canada, and in America. People are fallen into this thing. And those of us who are awake enough to say, hey, what's going on here? Why are you trying to destroy America right in front of our eyes? Why are you trying to bring down Canada right in front of our eyes? Why are you trying to bring down all these good things? And the people are rising up. So again, it's such a big subject. I can't do it justice. But there actually are, there actually is in two years, an attempt to take over mankind, right? And so it's, I just want to say it's on the table. It's not a vague spiritual force. It's embodiment within people who have maleficent, I don't know what, now, no, Maleficent bad, is intentions. Good. <laughs> bad, bad intentions and that is going to awaken in us the true desire to come to Mashiach but it's not as if it's only this it's not only a, it's not only a, um, it, it, it's it's actually happening it's we're it's, we're privileged to live this time so Torah is again also not just an abstract it's who's Rachel for me? Who's Moshe for me? Who's David for me? Anybody in the world, everybody should learn the Torah as a personal guide to who I am. What did they go through? The real people, they suffered. Joseph was in a dungeon, right? David was chased as a fugitive. There were black sheep. They were hated by their people, by the brothers, or at least some of them. I have that in my life. Oh, I see. Why does Hashem give this to me? Why does a God has given this to me? It's because he gave it to them. And that's what, and they, and they grew from that and became great. I too can become great. Rachel stands there and says, you think that I'm so great that I look down at you? I love you so much. I'm, you can do, you're doing much more than I could ever have done. That's the love of the Avot and the Imahot, of the fathers and the mothers. They love us and care for us and tell us that we can do it. But again, the struggle is, is there. Uh, somebody asked me a question is this before we, uh, we got on here, and I'll stop as soon as I can. They have this struggle between co-creativity 
I want to make my life. I want to go out and do things. I want to teach. And they brought a quote from the Swana Marevi. You have to do bitul. You have to know that even your biggest dreams are a golden calf if they're done the wrong way. So I said, really, I learned from bowing. Bowing, we bow and we say, blessed are you. And we get up on Hashem. On Hashem's name. Bowing is that I bow my lusts and my desires to you. I lust and I, my, I offer them up to you. I can't handle them on my own. I try my best. My emotions and my emotional state, I bow down to you and I offer it up to you. My mind, my intellect, my ability to think, I bow down to you. My greatest ideas and also my darkest ideas, I bow down and I offer them up to you. And then Hashem says, now stand up. Stand up and be great. I don't want you to walk around bent down. I want you to stand up and know that I am the one who gives you the ability to be who you are. That's true humility. Not being bent down, but standing up and coming into our power, but knowing where our power is coming from. So this is a, a personal relationship with the Torah, with God in the Torah, with the, with the personages in the Torah that are giving, they're like a, a power book. We plug into that power book and we get, we get the power of who we are. And we go into our own life. I'll say one more thing. Where do you prove God? You prove God by going and doing the book report of your own life. How did I, how was, why was I born to those parents that I was born? Why did I have to grow up in that family? Why did I have those teachers? Why didn't I have somebody great in my life telling me that I could be great? <clears throat> the way I grew up, I didn't know who I was. I, don't, I didn't know what I know now, that I can look back and see that there was something there. There was a guiding hand in my life. It was completely impossible for me to know it at the time. But now I can look back and see that there was a guiding hand, that my life has been guided. To find that in your own life is the proof of God. That our, your, your life, my life, our lives, individually and collectively, it could not be unless there was a divine being who cared for us and who wants us to come up to bat. But the coming up to bat, again, like Ani said, it's a struggle against my own negative forces. But yes, I can do it. Yeah, I'm. I'm really glad you didn't hold back. I wanted. I wanted to say this. The reason that the reason for this panel is to provide different points of view, and there isn't anything that anyone said here that's not true. It's just that none of us, none of our perspectives are complete, right, and all encompassing. And um, it's beautiful yeah, to be here with please, all of you. Thank you. Please, please don't hold back because uh, I mean, by now most people in the audience already. I think most people in my audience anyway are very aligned with that perspective and feel very much like. Um, so crying, yeah. crying, please, please forgive me one more moment. Crying from, from my own pain of not being close to Hashem is what can bring me closer. But if I don't feel those emotions, if I don't enter into those and breathe into them and allow them to come up and allow myself through breathing or whatever form I want to take, but to feel my own emotions. Wow, I feel so fearful. I feel so alone, like the rabbi said. But to feel that, not just intellectualize it, that's the processing of it that allows me to become greater as a result of these things that are, that are confronting me. So the individual level that all of us need is deep inner work. And then we are totally free from the incredible hype that's been placed on people's minds on the darkness that covers the earth and people's minds we become free of that we become wow what an amazing opportunity to be given in this lifetime but yeah. we also have to help others and how to do that is the question how do we we can talk torah and talk about shabbos and talk about the mashiach but it has to be that we speak to the mentality that's actually there the democrat in los angeles the democrat in new york the person who thinks he knows what life is about, who's been, who's been educated in, an, in a, godless, a godless university system that's taken away his soul, he doesn't even know it's a man, or a, a man or a woman. These are forces that are fighting to undermine the entire basis of life. And so our fight back has to be just as strong and stronger. Uh, so first of all, everybody, every, you, I hope everybody's reading the comments while, you know, in, while you're listening. I'm, I'm speaking to the speakers primarily because you can see that nobody's taking this as anything but like a real display of different different angles on truth and all are all are 
crucially important parts of what we're all going through now. So I, I don't know, if, I think we covered at least the two rounds of my questions. If anybody, whoever, who wants to speak to any of this and you don't have to hold back. Like I, um, a couple of us here were at least on one panel where it got kind of hot. I don't know if it's gonna get hot or if it has to get hot, but um, in terms of not seeing things the same way, but it doesn't matter because it's reality and we have to be in reality. That's what I started out by saying. And I mean that with everything I've got here and um, yeah, we're all experiencing what's happening now in very, very personal and very challenging ways and often very exciting ways. Again, that's why I ask the questions the way I do. So people are asking you, Rabbi Satan, and everybody, please, everybody here, everybody here has worlds to offer of wisdom and information and tools. But people are asking, what are they supposed to do about this? Like you're saying, we have to step, we have to process our fears. Rabbi Jacobson said, like Ani said, um, like all of you said actually, and but then what? Then what? When my when the traumas have graded against me to bring out the deeper parts of me and that ability to be, you know, part of the solution to to make the difference in the world, what is that? How do people do that? Hey, may I weigh in? Please. Okay. Um, recently I was invited to speak. It was actually, uh, I would say, a combination of a friendly and a hostile audience. It was quite an interesting, eclectic mix. And it was uh, quite provocative and controversial. And um, one of the questions I was asked was about the, the latest development, so to speak, that some see as being literally the world of Sodom and Gomorrah, of this world of uh, where gender, crisis, transgender, as well as the areas of different, uh, we'll call it sexual behavior, and um, people seeing that as being the darkest of the dark, and what my reaction was to all of that. Doesn't that seem to be a setback that goes against what uh, I was sharing and many share, that we're going closer to redemption, not farther from it. And this was not a necessarily a religious audience. This was many secular people. And I saw immediately from a few questions that I asked that they were very mixed. You had Republicans and Democrats, since that name was mentioned, I'm, I felt I should mention it as well. You had people right, extreme right, extreme left, and so on. And my response was that in any situation, let's use medicine as an example, you have to distinguish between symptoms and causes. Is one thing to talk about symptoms, and yes, often you have to address the symptoms. You need a Band-Aid, you need a painkiller, you need to um, bl bl block, block the leaks, and you need to uh, repair whatever you can short-term. But if you really want real change, you have to think of long-term, the bigger picture, and getting at the root of the issues, not just remedial medicine, but addressing the root of it. And what I pointed out was, was that we have a crisis of sexual identity today that isn't necessarily about gay and homosexual and transgender. That's where it may be most acute and most pronounced and people, uh, the, it's the lightning rod that gets everybody's attention. But it's as if saying that the heterosexual community has it all figured out. There's not, we're lacking a healthy attitude toward intimacy and intimacy inf impacts not just the individuals but also children and generations to come. And we just don't have a sanctity around these matters. So if you really want to address the root of it, you have to address the education of our children and of ourselves, of how we look at ourselves. So talk about solutions. We have a almost 4,000 year old prayer that we say in the morning. It's called Moda'ani. Thank you. Thank you for returning my soul to me. If we said this individually and with our children every morning, and not just lip service, but with deep passion and explain, your soul was sent to this world by God to bring light to the world. There are many forces of darkness, but you are not a product of darkness and you're not a victim of darkness and you're not defined by darkness and pain, even though you may experience it. And we have experienced it. We went through a Holocaust and we experienced it in the past and present. And unfortunately, personally, many people have experienced, but that's not who you are. You are an ashama. 
and Hashemesh and Asata be Tahirihi. And this soul is pure, always pure. And you have the power that's stronger than anything out there. If we empower our children with an identity, let's call it a spiritual identity, that they know who they are, they won't then have to seek out their identity because they they don't know. When there's a vacuum, nature abhors a vacuum and human beings abhor a vacuum. So it's really about being proactive in teaching each one of us right now, beginning this moment. Who are you? What are you defined by? Are you defined by your fears and inhibitions and insecurities? Are you defined by your darkness? Are you defined by your light and by your soul? And if you define yourself that way, how are you helping others define themselves that way? That is the key. And that transcends politics, that transcends Democrats and Republicans and transcends all the different polarization because everybody has a soul and everybody is in it together. To suggest there's one group of people that are the problem is incorrect. We're living in a collective problem. We're all in the same boat. And whether it's in the media or not, yes, there are different political opinions. I understand they're conservatives and they're liberals and so on. And each one has perhaps their own virtues or don't have. I'm not getting into that. Are we are meant here to bring out the idea there's no such thing as a democratic soul or a Republican soul or a conservative or liberal soul. There's only one type of soul. It's called the divine soul. And if we take that road and that's what we infuse in our children and ourselves, that offense is the best defense. At the same time, I understand we have to deal with short-term problems. I'm not naive. We have to lock our doors. I understand there are enemies. That doesn't take away from the fact that we really want change. It has to come on the longer term and the bigger picture change, while we also address the immediate issues that people are struggling with as we speak. I, okay, thank you. I want to I want to jump in and say a couple quick things. Number one, I want to speak to the audience. I've I some people who are here are new to my you know to me, and I to them. Some people here have been in my circle for a long time. I think it's time for me to say something, and that is, we don't want to be censored anymore like nobody needs to be censored there's not one side that gets to censor and another side that doesn't you know we all have vastly different perspectives obviously or we wouldn't be in this situation part of what's going on here is prophesied also that there's a certain birurim i'm speaking to the audience not to any of the speakers there's a certain birurim there's a certain this is this is prophesied by daniel and, uh, and i'm sure other places speakers know more than me about uh, what the other sources are, but there is an unsifting or a rather a sifting out of the confusion that happened with the the eight sadas eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, where it's really easy for evil to masquerade as good. And it's really good for it's really easy for good to be suppressed by evil. And it's not that anybody, you know, other than the greatest Sadiqim are free of any kind of negativity or what we would call, you know, not evil intentions necessarily, but the evil is the covering of God. Evil is the covering of the truth. Most people are sincere and good hearted, not everybody. But the problem is that we are, I have experienced as someone who is more on the page of Rabbi Sutton, what Rabbi Sutton expressed in personal life, in my personal perspectives, being very much in the minority and that perspective being suppressed from every every angle. So I'm only saying this now, like I don't, I try to speak more to the light and the personal empowerment and the and the the reality of Geula because I feel it's the most uplifting, but it, it is, I, I no longer can not speak back when people say, please change your language, please don't talk about that. Like we need to talk about things. And if somebody disagrees, disagree, disagree. You don't, you have a different perspective, bring up your, perspe your perspective and the reasons why you feel that way. Part of the deepest clipa from my perspective that is going on now is a suppression of honest discourse. If we humans could just get together and talk to each other without having to be, oh, don't say that, don't say that, you know, don't, it's, it's, if we could just really talk and listen and then express why we disagree and then listen again. I think so much of this would be over so fast, but that so far has been suppressed. And, and I think that all of us who care need to stand up against it, which means listen and talk and don't be afraid and don't have to couch your words in forms that will make everybody feel good about what you have to say. Because actually the truth is that nobody feels very good right now. And we need to get into that deeper, you know, the healing of like the Rebbe says, is like it says in Hayom Yom, the, for the 50%, if I'm wrong, correct me. Um, any of you here, if I misquote exactly, but 50% of the of curing an illness is recognizing what it is. 
And it does not mean that you're not going for the healing. And it doesn't mean that the illness is not there for the healing. And it doesn't mean that there's not a totally new potential for healing. And it doesn't mean that the whole world hasn't already changed because it has. And, uh, it, it, but we have to be real. That's what I started out by saying. So that was the first thing I wanted to say. The second thing, I don't remember. <laughs> Maybe it doesn't matter. Anyway, but we need to, all of us here, that, that is, in my opinion, maybe the number one most important thing that has to change, that we just have to be seeking a deeper truth. And I think everybody here can agree with that from whatever perspective. Okay, who wants to say something else? There are a lot of questions. Are all the speakers reading the questions? Rabbi Wolf, did you want to speak to this in any way? Um, you know, or the one the thing that comes to, to mind in this whole discussion is, you know, in the in the as, as Rabbi Jacobson had mentioned that there is the there is the symptoms and there is the essence of it, and it, it, the the symptoms it could be very ugly, but when, especially from the perspective of Hasidus, when you look deeper, you can see that the very very problem that buried in the very very problem. I'm not talking about those that are trying to download the software. I'm, there, there are, I have no question, and in that I, I completely agree with Rabbi Sutton has been saying, there are some really, really mischievous, dark entities in the world that are putting up a last fight. There, there is no question in that. But we're talking about the billions of young people, the innocent, good people are good people. These are the people that Mashiach is coming to. We can't flush all these people down and say, you know, th you know three quarters of humanity is, is, is out. We have to realize on a much deeper level what, what, what are people struggling with and why are they revolt? What's going on with this identity, gender identity crisis? So when we learn Hasidus, for instance, we find out that Mashiach is identity. Mashiach is Yechida. Mashiach is the essence of being. So when, when, when we're entering into this time when the deepest core of who you are, not your, not your um, you know, Rabbi, Rabbi um, Jacobson was bringing the Lekai Neshama Shenasata be Tahirahi. I am pure. The Neshama that was given to me, we say every morning, she's pure. And then we say, Ata Barasa, you, you created it. Ata Yitzarta, you formed it. Ata Nefachta, you blew it into me. So the question that the Hasidic in, in the, the discourses of Hasidus, it says, how can you talk about the soul and say she's pure before you even said she was created? It should say the soul was created was formed and after i know it was created and formed i can say it was pure this soul is pure so but the the deeper meaning is your soul exists before it was created the creation is a more external development of the soul the soul comes down to be to experience itself within already certain definitions but that's already a latter state mashiach is opening up our souls to the state of pre-created existence where the definitions that define you yesterday are not that, they don't make up your true, true being. It doesn't mean that you can undo that if God created you as a man or God created as you a woman, that you can choose to undo that. Absolutely not. But when you're living your life, you're living from a much deeper place of identity, of who am I? I'm not defined by anything, by any, and I am choosing. It's almost like a choice. I am choosing to be alive. I'm choosing to be pre present. I am I don't know. Maybe I'm not even. I'm, I, I, I'm, I, I ha, I've, I've been. I've been. You know, I haven't developed this thought yet. But but I'm going to give a little example just from 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 the Rebbe when it came to the time of the '60s, and everybody was getting terrified by the by the hippie movements, and and people were seeing it as a total rebellion of the youth, of a total frivolousness, of a total people seeking to be, you know, to live life without any boundaries and so on and so forth. And the Rebbe looked much deeper and the Rebbe said, these are people that cannot, they're not, that they're, they're, their souls are crying out that the materialistic life that their parents were giving them by coming, you know, the, 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 the generation that was coming and seeing it all as, as success, as materialistic wealth and so on and so forth, these people were rebelling against that. So I think we have to look much deeper into what's driving this question of identity. And we have to speak to the very identity of who are you on a much deeper level of 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 beingness, and in that sense, that's where Mashiach comes in to open you up to your deepest core of Yechida. So again, how does that move into um, the 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 misinterpretations as that as that itself can be misinterpreted as I can choose whether I'm a man or a woman or things like that? That's the klipa. That's the chitzanius of it. We need to tap into that energy and 
and, and bring the truth of it. Yes. That, 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 that's, that's what I'm touching on. And I need, I could use uh, a lot of help by the other panelists to clarify that. But, but there is something there. There's something there about essence there of something about totally identity. Something there. Yeah, yeah. Essence rather that's than identity. A hundred percent. I want to ask Ani to, um, Ani, it's been a while since you've weighed in, Ani, in a moment, but I just also want to say, and again, anybody can be, feel free to bash my perspective, anybody, if you want to, because that's what we, that's what it's about. But I really believe we're in Gogo Magog in this final war. And I think it's not necessarily taking exactly the form of certain prophecies, but I do know that in, in, in 1963, um, Chelek Yod Ches the Rebbe is clearly stating that, in, that uh, based on the prophet Micha, that there will come a time when, the, when we are surrounded by many nations to the point where we won't be able to depend upon human help or trust in humans. And he talks about it from two perspectives. The first thing he says is this describes, the prophet describes a time of such evil, not only outside of the Jewish people, but within the Jewish people, the Rebbe, and the Rebbe uses the word ra, evil, that we will not be, it will be up beyond human help. And we will need God to relieve us, to save us from it. And, and basically that's what this time is about on that, on that more physical plane that we everybody needs to turn to God because the problems are greater than their solutions and the answers that we have. But the problems are greater than the answers that we have because everybody needs to turn to God. So, and then he talks about, well, he asked the question, why? This is called the, for the beginning of Geula. I'm paraphrasing, but ac I hope ac accurately. This is the first phase of Geula. Why is the first phase of Geula? Increased darkness, increased challenge, increased revealed evil to the point where it feels like there's no way out. And that is because we're supposed to make a switch in our ground of being. And I think that fits with what you're saying very much about essence. The Rebbe says we need to switch from the Isha, from connection to the Isha Elyon, the supernal man, to the level of Mamali Kol Amin, to Soviet Kol Amin, a more, much more direct relationship with God. I don't want to take the airtime because I want to hear from the speakers. But I, but I just think it's really important that to, everybody has to see that we, we live in a multiple layered reality. And, and what's happening deep beneath the surface, like when the soul comes into the body, a new life is conceived, a new baby, and that, that infinite life force, semi-infinite life force of the soul and the soul's divine mission is coming in and enlivening the body. Most of the soul isn't in the body, but it's enlivening the body anyway. And it's what shows up in the body is, you know, the rest is, is sort of cut off, but is meant to come in. This is, you know, it bring, there's a new... Um, process and an inauguration of a new process that is rising up from the inside in every time a baby is born, every time the soul comes into the body, but but also this is happening to all of humanity. It literally is a birth process. So of course, what's rising up from beneath the surface? That is that is, some of the speakers here are speaking to that. And we need to understand what that is, the rising of the Yechida, the revelation of what was always inside that was hidden from us by the Tzimtzum. I think Rabbi Jacobson talked about that. That, but and then what is that what is pushing up as this new force is rising up what's pushing up that was hidden beneath the surface and a lot of that is on a physical level is showing up as dark agendas that humanity is suppressed humanity humanity is is depressed repressed and that is prophesied not because we're supposed to be stuck in it and not because we're supposed to do nothing about it I think that I think that mainly me, my opinion is mainly it's a thing of consciousness, because if we really understood what's going on, we wouldn't be we wouldn't say yes to things that we shouldn't say yes to. And that's the bottom line, because it really doesn't. I don't think that it has that much force anymore. I think it's about us claiming our own inner freedom. And, yeah. and that comes from a connection to our own deepest inner self, which is Hashem and Hashem's plan, which is what the prophecy summit is about. And that's my perspective. Ani, what, you want to speak to it first and then anybody. Yeah, sure. On anything, feel free to answer yeah. audience questions also. Everybody has access in the chat. There are lots of them. Yeah, well, I'm, you know, the Rebbe, the Rebbe said that, you know, in this generation, he's, he's speaking to people individually, but this applies to the collective as well, that, you know, whatever schmutz is left on us in our world is just the most external fringes of the garments. So the stuff that's being pushed up through the world, it looks so massive and intense and scary, but it's like the last kind of fumes that are left and it's making a lot of noise and it looks very disruptive but we need to look we I always say Hasidus to our mysticism is a map of reality it's not a philosophy it's not you know inspirational posters god forbid it's an actual map of reality and the Geula process is about tuning ourselves back into actual reality to, to overcoming 
the, you know, the, the displacement, like Rabbi Jacobson said, of, of the Gullis experience, which is where I'm outside of reality. I'm outside of how reality actually functions. I'm susceptible to being pumped full of lies and misunderstandings and false beliefs about myself, reality, God, everything. And so what we're seeing now is just we can look at it and say, this is catastrophic. What's going to happen? It's the final battle. There's so much sus suspense. There's no suspense. We know how this ends. We know how this ends. This is just these forces like, bye. The more we cuff, I love this Yiddish word, the more we cuff, we like cook and stew in something and the emotional drama of it, uh, the more power we end up giving it. And we have to understand that it does, it does pose a danger to individuals, you know, this, this process, people can get sucked up into things that end up being harmful and dangerous to them. And that is very real and true. And also we have to try, I think personally, we have to try to not invest our emotions there because the altar Rebbe teaches us that the power, the powerful currency of the soul is where we invest our emotional energy. So if I can look clinically at these processes and know what they are and, and see them through the eyes of Hasidus, which are the eyes of reality, I can, I, there's nothing more powerful than my consciousness, than my das, than the eyes I'm looking at the world with. So if I'm looking in alignment with what Hasidus tells me is happening in the world right now, I can help usher this along in a much smoother way. I can, you know, help choose and manifest the reality that's this, this can play out just poof. Oh, it's gone now. Oh my God. We woke up the next day. You know, we, we woke up the next morning and, and, and communism was over and the wall fell. It was a bloodless revolution. We have a precedent for that already. The Rebbe, the Rebbe told us that's how it is. That's, that's how it goes. It just, you wake up, it's, oh, it's done. You know, the deep state or the snake or whatever you want to call it, you wake up the next one, it's gone. If we, if we can extract our soul currency, you know, from those battles and instead put them into, I think, first and foremost, um, receiving my Gula vision and, cr and creating in my life, my personal Gula, my Gula practice, and busy ourselves with that, not, not to not understand what's going on, but that's a powerful way to extract my investments from that reality and invest in a Geula reality. And Rabbi Wolf is talking about, you know, the Yechida being activated, receiving from the Yechida, this, this, the, our Pnei Mashiach, the spark of Mashiach. So on a functional level, the Yechida is identified with the soul power of Keser, um, the crown. And what, what is it that's within the crown? There are a couple of powers within the crown. So there's will or desire. Uh, the, I'm sorry. The outermost le outermost level is is um, is will or desire. Then there's a muna, and the deepest is pleasure. So within in in the yachida, where the yachida lives, the yachida itself, we have we have a will will or desires for things. We have a muna, and we have and we have pleasure. So tuning into my gaula vision is really like getting to know myself at the deepest level. And asking myself, you know, like, like, what are the things that I really want that will just help me to feel expansive and with manuhas and nefesh, like, you know, a sense of, of ease in my life. And we may have a lot of shoulds. This is what makes me a good girl or a good boy. I should want these things, but actually, but if I'm going deeper, oh, my soul, my soul actually wants something else. And, and to also understand that this is all about knowing ourselves really deeply and getting a much deeper sense of myself and the forces that act within me. Because again, we have the ability now to expand out into the world, to be in this world where, where we can activate the Rebbe said, Chaim Nitzchem Li Hefsek, with eternal life without interruption. The plan is for us to be souls and bodies here forever in this world, expanding more and more into the world, not to escape it. So I want to be in a mode of not, I have to be very mindful and careful about where the desires are coming from. But once I learn how to tune into that frequency of my soul, I, I can I can trust that vision. And I'll give the example. I've, I've given it to you many times, and I'm sorry if people are sick of hearing me talk about this, but I'm I'm a horse person, so I'm always going to talk about my horse. That's we're notorious for that. For somebody just you know, you meet someone in an elevator, you're like I want to see a picture of my horse. Um, but so I have a horse, and I'm a serious equestrian. And this was one of those desires that kind of started to download a couple of years ago. I, I grew up riding. And then when I started to become religious, I, I gave it up. It was just, you know, moving out of that time in my life, I had my own horse. And a couple of years ago, I was like feeling from that frequency of my soul, like it would be awesome to start riding again. And, you know, all of the shoulds, the aspect of my Nafisha Bahamas, that's just like people pleaser, be a good girl. That's outside the box. Don't go there. Was like are a from woman riding horse. What is, what are you talking about? So I went, we went to talk to the rub about it. And he was like, 
make sure your knees are covered and have a female trainer and go have fun. So I was like, all right, so let me, you know, let me get into this. So I started taking riding lessons again. And I, and then six months ago, bought my own horse. His name is Thunder. He's got a nice little Yiddish name. Um, but the going with that desire opened up as we were talking about when you honor the physical in a correct way, a guuladic way, an integrated way, there's going to be so much roughness that that comes from it. Spiritual, spiritual productivity as well. It's two sides that will fuel each other when it's done correctly. So the, the Kiddush Hashem that I've been able to make at this farm, thank God, is unbelievable. I'm like bringing all the time with everybody there, Jew, non-Jew, about Hasidus. Um, I've been able, I've been able to influence a lot of other you know, Jewish young women who have, who have come to the barn and show that you can do it without compromising any standards of modesty whatsoever and still be a high level rider. Just going, going somewhere where previously it would have been like, what are you doing there? Like, what, what are you doing in a barn? Like you wrote a book on the Tanya, what are you doing in a barn? Um, but that there's no contradictions. <laughs> And there's no contradictions. And, and not only are there no contradictions, but it's an emergence of essence. And if we can stop, like, but it does take deep knowing of ourselves. I, I can't tell you how many times I had existential crisis coming home from my writing lesson and be like, is this real? Is this really what my soul wants? But the spiritual fruits that have come from it are, are out of this world. And then we've also integrated working with the horses in my school, which has been out of this world for the girls as well. Just so incredible for them and for their development. So when you can trust these things, and the Reva also says that part of the Google process is that we're expanding the bounds of Kedusha. Now that does not, God forbid, mean we go outside the bounds of Halacha. That's no, never. But expanding the bounds of what we would have previously considered holy, bringing Kedusha to new dimensions, new places that we would have never imagined before. Like that is, that's what we're here to do. That's what we're here to do. And so to learn how to tune into those desires, these things that will bring me a true deep satisfaction and pleasure, even if it seems a little bit out of the box, if we, if we're checking ourselves, you know, incredible things can come from it. Okay. Who has, who's, who's feeling triggered or inspired Wants to jump in? I just want to add one more thing really quick. It's just a funny point. As far as Gaula upgrades go, when, when I bought my horse, horses have a, a, like a barn name, which is like their nickname and then a fancy show name. So his show name was Midlife Crisis. I felt really bad for him. So he's gotten an upgrade. His show name is now Redemption Mindset. That's really funny. Yeah. So there's that. You live it in the details. Okay. Well, we wish we could influence humans as easily as we can horses. <laughs> I, I, this is maybe a good moment to ask you, what, how, how do you see reaching 1.8 billion people? We'll, we'll take a little um, foray into that. And, that. and then maybe the question of how can people actually, you already started to say whatever it is that you're, I would add to what you said about, you know, a smile, be part of the, you know, the, I forgot the word you used, the transmission instead of just the receiving. But I think, you know, I would say, and I do say that when something bothers you in the world, what would be the opposite of that? Why does it bother you? If it wasn't there, what would be possible? And then be more of that. There's not a person in the world that can't do that in all kinds of ways. What were you gonna say then, Rabbi Jacobson? How do we reach 1.8 billion people and how can everybody be involved? Well, I just wanted to share, just a story came to mind when I heard you speaking and, uh, and the others. There was uh, these two Hasidim who lived in the city called Kharkov. It was a big city, um, actually in Ukraine. And uh, they came to see the, the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, of Yosef Yitzchak. And uh, they were both working in that city. The first one came into the Rebbe and the Rebbe asked him, so what's going on in Kharkov? And he said, he gave a, a really bad report. He said, people are very materialistic. They're busy with making money. You can't get them to come to a davening, to a minion. You can't get them to come to classes. But I'm trying my best, but it's very, uh, it's, it's very, it's very uh, despondent and, de and, and challenging and, and depressing. Okay, so the Rebbe gave him a blessing. Hopefully it gets better. And he leaves uh, the room. Then comes the second guy. And he goes in to see the Rebbe. And the Rebbe asks him, what's going on in Kharkov? I said, Kharkov? There's challenges, but thank God, I have a share every week. 
we have Fabrengans, we study, we learn, more and more people are coming. You know, he had a different perspective on this city. So the Rebbe gave him a, part a participation. He gave him some money. He said, let me probably be a partner with you. Okay. When he leaves the room, he tells his friends, friend got very upset. And he asked the Rebbe afterwards, he says, why is it that you didn't uh, help me as well? The Rebbe said, you think I didn't know what's going on in Kharkov? I want to know what's going on by you. I know what's <laughs> going on in Kharkov. I don't know where your head is at. I think the way to reach 1.8 billion, or for that matter, uh, 8 billion people, is the same way you reach one person. A resonating message that's relevant and personal, psychologically, emotionally, and spiritually. As I mentioned before, most people's attitude to God and to Torah and to mitzvahs is informed, or I should say misinformed, by stereotypes, myths that come from the media and from mass misinformation and disinformation on what religion really is. In the classic words of Elbev Yitzhak by Ditchev, he told a self-proclaimed atheist, the God you don't believe in, I also don't believe in. So what re what's required is we're not dealing with a neutral situation. We're dealing with tremendous amount of ignorance and more importantly, stereotypes, which is a negative attitude, not based on reality, it's based on their experiences. Everybody has the way they look at Kharkov. People project, it's called projection. The key is to touch people in a place that resonates, and I say again, relevant. When you take God's message, whether it's from the Pasha, whether it's from the when, whether it's from a holiday, whether it's from anything, and you can present it in a way that someone says, ah, that resonates. Wow, that gives me that enlightens something inside of me. That's something I always knew, but I didn't quite know that this is coming from Torah, which is here thousands of years old. That is the secret to transformation. You're not going to transform anybody without a relevant resonating message because often it's presented in a condescending way or judgmental way or by people who don't know how to communicate. Now, I'm not here to criticize anyone. The fact of the matter is we have 14 and a half million Jews on this earth and 80, 90%, if not higher, are assimilated. And many are intermarried and not even due to their own fault. They don't even know better. It's a serious number. You have 8 billion people on this earth Probably more than two, around two thirds will claim they believe in God. But the question is, do they live God, godly lives? And what are their godly lives? And many beautiful people out there. Rabbi Wolf mentioned, I totally concur. Especially now, you have young children being born by the millions every day. And these are innocent souls sent by God to this world. So the challenge is, what is the formula to communicate with them? And if you can create a proof of concept that works with 10 yeah. people, then it's a matter of replicating it. So without going into a whole strategic business plan, the key is, is to take the messages that resonate, that are true, their integrity is maintained, but they speak to people's hearts and souls of different types of people. People are different. And replicating that, that's called, in the words of Mashiach to the Baal Shem Tov, when the Baal Shem Tov said, when will you come? He used three words. Kishiafutsu, mayanesecha chutzah. When your wellsprings, which is the inner wellsprings of the soul teachings, will be disseminated, your futsu will be dis distributed, disseminated, chutza, to the farthest outskirts of the world, that's when I shall come. So I believe the challenge is in the first word, your futsu. We have the wellsprings. We have the messages. We have the chutza. We have the market. But the distribution, the distribution of reaching as many people as possible, replicating it, in a way that resonates is the great challenge. Mm. So that's exactly what I work on. This is what I work on day and night, 24-7, I can say, even seven, even Shabbos. Not obviously with work Shabbos, but plenty of thinking to do. And uh, it's one of the reasons that, uh, that I believe we're all here. We're here to use the technology, the platform shifter that you created to reach as many people as possible. And hopefully it resonates so that they will share and pay it forward like a ripple effect or using... Uh, a modern terminology, the butterfly effect, that even the flutter of a butterfly in one little corner of the world can, can create a typhoon, in this case, a spiritual typhoon, all over the world. Yes, well said. Obviously, nobody can do it alone, and we're all here to be our peace. What I'm getting, one of the things I'm getting from everything I'm hearing and feeling, and I know this from my life as well, 
is that to make a real quantum shift in my own being and through that by extension in the world, for any of us, I think we have to be willing to see what's in the, we have to know we have an essential being like the Yechida, an essential mission, or we just get stuck in the darkness and the flaws, you know, the shame, the guilt, the fear, the rage. If we, but if we get, if we only lean into our essential being, then we're covering over, suppressing or floating on top of that darkness that's that in, in which is really hidden the greatest light as the mystical texts tell us and as experience can tell us. So I think that we have to connect to that light of the future the and the, that future that's emerging now, the clear awareness of what's possible as far as we can be aware of it and who we really are as far as we can be aware of that. And then from that larger space and maybe with help from others, look at what's in the way. And I think the same thing has to apply on the macrocosm that when we look at, you know, there are plenty of people who are upset, really upset about things that are happening in the world now. And I think there are gonna be more people more upset, you know, every day. But if we, that's a dead end, that's a wall if we stop there, or even if we start there, because underneath that is what is the plan and process that's unfolding. And that's really the major purpose of this summit to, you know, to, to share that, to start to share that in, de in deeper ways. And then where, where, what is your role in that? And what is the solution? What is meant to, what is being called out of us? Like everybody basically has spoken to already based on these things that are happening. And from that larger space, I think that's the only space in which we can change things. And I think it is the space that we're meant to change things from. And I think we're not doing it anywhere near alone. So there's the human aspect. We have to be involved. But it's not, you know, it's not up to us. It's up to us to, to participate as responsibly, as consciously as possible, to influence our, our deeper selves, our shallower selves and other people to do the same, but to do it in that context of, you know, of, of everything that's happening without that we're sitting ducks, it's over. And, you know, that's just on that side, we're, we're not sitting ducks and it's not over and it's happening and everybody has a role. And I think that if we can connect on that level and, and again, with authentic awareness, the ability to look honestly, truly at ourselves and things that we haven't yet seen, to hear things from others that trigger us and not just push back from the trigger, but ask ourselves when we're triggered, like, what, what is the fear in here? What is it I'm trying not to see? I think that will, it will not take very much time till things really start to shift. And I also, I also very much believe that everything that's happening in the world, even from people that may have a negative agenda, and I do believe that there are those, plenty of those, but it's a small, I also believe it's a small portion of the world. And most people are really good hearted, sincere, and just being triggered or, you know, ignorant. I think there's a final attempt to suppress the rising of humanity, which is the rising of the soul, which is the, the personal geula and the general geula. You know, zelu umetzeh. That's how it's created. So I, I think that bigger picture is super important, and I think the fact that everybody's speaking from a different perspective is so much a part of it. I okay. Build off of what Rabbi Wolf said, the idea of yichida is to show the words of the five levels of the soul, how you connect from nefesh, which is where we live. We live within our body. And we want our body to be a temple for the higher levels of our soul. Because we are a microcosm and we contain all of these within ourselves. In addition to the fact that Yechida is Keter and it's Adam Kadmon and all these upper worlds, those upper worlds all have trace elements within each one of us. We are made in a microcosm of the entire system. So connecting to the Yechida means connecting to my highest essence and eventually then bringing more of that higher essence down all the way into our life as we live it here. Right. Into what Ami calls my nefesh behemit, my, I, I call my, 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 Human. my most animal aspect of my life. But that can be sanctified and elevated. The whole point of going up into Yechida is to come back down with more Yechida into my being as now. When we say, Modiani, we thank you for giving me my soul. I thank you for returning my soul to me. So the question is, well, wait a second, who's me? 
who's the me who's saying, thank you for giving me my soul? Mm -hmm. So at that moment, it's called Ani. It's the deepest level that I know of my own personality. But the, and that is a vehicle or a vessel to the highest level of my soul called Neshama and Chayim Yechida. By the time we get to later on in a higher, more exalted level of the prayers, which is called the Amidah, the standing prayer, and we bow on Hashem's name, Baruch Atah Hashem, blessed are you Hashem, and we stand up, we are our Neshama. We have transitioned into knowing who we really are, and we're looking down at the little us who we begin in charge of to help that little boy, that little girl become great. In other words, this, the identification switches from, from Ani, from Nefesh, to Yechida. So it's a constant now then opening up the channel so that we're constantly, constantly bringing more of the higher level of ourselves. The Torah, we have a, in the Torah, we have Noah's Ark. He built an ark when Hashem told him to do three stories. The humans on the top level, the animals in the middle level, and the storage and waste on the bottle level. He had three sons, and they all correspond to the three levels. These three sons, all of mankind came. We have all three levels. In the temple, there was three main levels, the Holy of Holies, the Holy, the sanctuary, and the outside courtyard, which is corresponds to the digestive system. The inner, the sanctuary corresponds to the heart respiratory, to the to respiratory, and here's the nervous system. So you have the nervous system and the cardiovascular here, and you have the digestive and the reproductive. You, are, you have all of mankind in you. And why is this so important? Is that I can go up from my lower levels into my own, the higher, what I call the higher stories of my own building and bring down from there. So what I'm going, going towards is that when we do this inner work, and connect with this higher level and this natural pattern to do it. It's not like just jumping up the Yehida. Then, I, when I, then when I come back down into my nefesh, into my ruach, into my healthy emotions, I can speak to others from that place. I, in my opinion, that's King David, that's Moshe, that's Rachel, that's Sarah. They did the work, the inner work. They connected up. They were bothered by the world. They were hurt by the pain. They went up and asked Hashem, why, Hashem, why is this world like this? They were taken up above space-time into their own yechida, into their connection with all the higher souls above, and they came back with a message. It may be hard down here, but our job, as you said, as all of you have said, is that we've come down to this world to bring the higher light down into this world, to be that soul power that can make a difference. In it. There's nothing greater than the power of our souls. And the force of evil is afraid of us. And that's yes. why it tries to put its thumb down on us and make sure that we don't believe in ourselves, which can, a little bit connects to all of what you're saying. There's no way to do that all. You've all said incredible things. But we're all trying to come from the deepest place inside of ourselves. And I believe that that's what's important about this. So um, uh, one more thing is King David said, even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. The you are with me in the, in the Psalm, King, Psalm, Psalm 23, the first three verses are in the third person. God, you're like a shepherd for those of us who need you. And he, you, we don't actually say you. We say he is a shepherd and he sustains me and he brings me back. And then in, when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, which is the fourth verse, I find you. Why you? Why do I need you right now? It's not enough to have you as an indirect relationship with you right now. I need you right now because it's hard. And I come into Yechida, how? In the damn pair mama, in the darkest place of, my, of, of, the, of the challenge of my life. That's where I come to the deepest resources of my own being. I'm calling upon King David said in, King, in Psalm 139, when I go up to heaven, you are there. When I go down to the deepest hell, you are here. And it's an incredible switch. You are here in hell. Why? There and here. The Hebrew is very clear. Sham ata hineka. Hine ata. You are here. I need to know you in the depths of my life. Then, knowing that, and that he wants us to come to our greatness, and to experience this, this inner level of our own being, believe in it, to know it, to access it. 
then then we the, the problems that are facing ourselves and mankind, when you're in the light, they're much different than when you're in the darkness. And I think perhaps that was a part of the disagreement. This disagreement. I, I I wanted to emphasize the darkness, but not that I want to live in the darkness. Not right. that I want to say and give it act and give it power. No, not at all. It's the recognition of it. Whatever yes. the case, I hope that, that this is helpful. No, it's, it's, massively, and it's not a disagreement. It's a different, literally, we talk about points of view or perspectives. That means that everybody's standing around a central truth that each of us from our point of view sees a certain piece. And that's how I, speaking to the audience also, there's a certain, there are gonna be certain things that you really care about. There are gonna be certain things that really bother you and certain things that you really wish everybody would realize. You know, I asked everybody in the beginning, what's your, to you, what's the greatest challenge? What's the thing you're most excited about? I could ask that equal to, equally to the audience. How about you guys share? What do you think is the greatest challenge? What are you the most excited about? And then the question, next question is how do we help each other and others to ask and answer those questions too, and then to start to live it. The, the greatest challenges are here to bring out the greatest light. We don't get the greatest light by ignoring them, nor do we get the greatest light by getting stuck in them. Both pieces are only here for the for the ultimate purpose. And that is on a, a fractal level. That's true for each one of us. I could say one more thing in relation to what Ani said, it's very back at the very beginning and also more recently about the that the Rebbe said that we're very close, right? And there's a famous thing that the crown has been all made and the jewels are all in place and we just have to shine up the jewels. That's the last thing. So it's the idea, it's the external part of reality seems so dark, but the internal reality, that which Moses fixed, that which David fixed, Yosef fixed, Sarah fixed, Adam, they all fixed reality, but on the inside, from the inside out. What they left us with is the outside. Mm. And, what the, and it looks like 99% of re reality is the outside. And like, what did they leave us? What did they do? Why did they leave us with so much work to do? But when you're on the inside and you know how much they did, the moon was fixed thousands of years ago. It just has to appear on the outside that it's just waning and waxing. The truth is on the spiritual level, it's all finished. All the inner work has been done. The external has been left to us. But it's not 99.9, and they, they did only the 1%. They did the 99.9, .9 and they left us with 1%. It just seems to us, from our external point of view, look what they left us with. And with this, I answer the, 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 the question that we have when we hear it extent, the statement that says, Yeshua Tashem Ayn. It means in English that the salvation of the Lord can happen in the blink of an eye. So our initial reaction is, well, wait a second, like, this is what they left us with, and you're telling me in the blink of an eye? Yes, because when I connect to the inner level, all the work that was already done by the great souls who were here, who were here and that includes ourselves, who were here also before, but whatever. Here we're, we came back in this time with eight, seven, eight billion, however many. Every soul that was ever born has all come back. Every reincarnation has all come back in one lifetime. Why? Because it's Act 3, Scene 3. Because this is the, the Lord has set this up, right? But the, the hair of eye, the blink of the eye, you're kidding? All this could change in the blink of an eye? And Ani said it, yes. Because from the inside level, when you attack, and what Rabbi Wolf said, when you connect to that inner Yehida, the inner being of who we really are, then there's no power in the world that can overcome us. Beautiful. Beautiful. So. Um, I'm going to, I'm just going to invite anybody who wants to still speak to this topic or what we discussed before Rabbi Wolf, it's been a while since we heard from you, please do. And also I'm going to start just, um, ask a, a question that just came by, which I kind of feel drawn to, um, somebody's asking, somebody says, I feel guidance from Hashem to help build the third temple. Any wisdom that you can share as to what the Torah says about the timeliness of that happening and what is needed for our souls to rise to that moment of redemption? She's pointing to you also, Rabbi Jacobson. She says that would be a miraculous marketing moment to reach the 1.8 billion. And I, I'm not sure that's not true. I actually got really into this many years ago, probably 1992, and um, collected gold jewelry from a bunch of women and, and you know, 
gave it to the Rebbe and whatever, long story short, um, well, long story unfinished, but it does seem like it, it, it is something that could really capture hind, hearts and minds of people, but how would it be done in a halachic way? Is there a halachic way? What does anybody have to say about the fact that it's going to come down from heaven, but we will finish it kind of like the 99.9% thing that you just said, Rabbi Sutton. And the Rebbe, when the Rebbe said, I've done everything I can, I, I, now I, all I can do is give it over to you, do everything you can, you know, that yes, the 99.9 or much, much more than that was already finished, but what is our part and how can we capture our own imaginations in a way that's exciting and beautiful and feels like we're building something wonderful within a Torah context. Anyway, Rabbi Wolf, if you want to speak first, because you are, have not said much too lately. Quiet. I'm, I'm too quiet. Come on. Too quiet. I'm, 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 I'm enjoying. I'm enjoying what is being said. I'm going okay. to jump in still and let others talk. Okay. okay. Rabbi let Jacobs. Me, so let me, so any, so yeah, let me yeah. speak to that. Okay, great. You know, um, the temple was destroyed almost 2,000 years ago, the second temple by the Romans. And we're told the reason for it was baseless hatred, sinas chinam. But here's the klotzkasha, the obvious question. Why would God's divine home be compromised because the people couldn't get along with each other? That's their problem. Let them clean up their act. And meanwhile, God's shechina, God's presence, can remain with us in the temple. So the answer is quite obvious. It says in the verse, "For us build for me a temple, and I will reside. I will dwell among you." As the shalah and others point out, it should have said, "I build me a temple, and I will dwell in it." You build a temple, and it's an it. It's not them. There's no them. We're not talking about people, because the whole point of the temple was to be a conduit an interface and a channel of divine presence, not in a building of, of materials and gold, silver, and copper, but or wood and the stone, but to be divine presence in our hearts and souls. And if our hearts and souls are not receptive, when the house, the family is fighting with each other, the father, the mother, the parent says, I can't be among you. So it's not about being in a building, which explains why the Yerushalmi, the Talmud says, that any generation that did not rebuild the temple is as if they destroyed the temple. Why are we to blame? It's one thing, okay, fine. We'll atone and we'll remember what happened by our ancestors. But why is it that if we don't rebuild the temple, it's as if we destroyed it? Because the destruction of the temple is not a one-time event. It's perpetual. Every moment that we don't have God's presence within us consciously, in a pure and pristine way, that's a destruction. And therefore, it's in our hands. The Talmud is actually not blaming us. On the contrary, it's giving us the responsibility. So it's one thing is to gather gold, silver, copper, but it's another is to make sure that our hearts and souls. So I think the effort to get 1.8 billion or 8 billion people or whatever the number is to rebuild the temple, I'm not worried about the materials. We have plenty of money in this world. There's plenty of gold, silver, and copper. There's everything you need to build a physical temple. The concern is the spiritual temple. If we get enough people who feel that their hearts and souls and their homes, their kitchens, their bedrooms, their dining rooms, their living rooms, how we walk, how we sleep, how we talk, how we deal in business is a keli, is a container for the divine presence, that is rebuilding the base of English. That's exactly the key. You correct that, the rest will follow. The physical will follow. That's the halachic way to do it. Okay. And Thank I agree you. with Rabbi Sutton and with what was said that yes, 99.9%, .9 listen, at the end of the day, blood, sweat, and tears for thousands of years have been shed. I mean, people have sacrificed their lives in the most horrendous ways and most beautiful yeah. ways for, for Yiddishkeit, for God, for mitzvahs. So it changed the world. The world is a not the same world as it was 3,000 years ago, or 2,000, or 1,000, or even 100 years ago. So we are at the threshold. But it's true, that last 1%, the Makkah is that final push over the finish line. You know, you run a marathon, you got to get over the finish line. That's where we are. And that sometimes can be quite challenging. Last birth pain, the last push. When you're going almost the speed of light, you have to put more energy into getting closer and closer to it. The closer you get, the more energy. 
the same with birth, the same with all these things. That's right. why it's so hard for us now, but it's coming closer. It's coming closer. Yeah, now it's a mindset change. It's a consciousness change into that Geula mindset, as we've been talking about. Yeah. And let's not forget the words of the Rambam, Maimonides. One act, one good word, one good thought can tip the scales and bring personal and global redemption. You need to know that. So there's no such thing as a small act. Yes, thank you. Okay, so for to the to the amazing audience um if you have question a burning question that didn't get asked most of them didn't get asked can you just repost it here so we can see it um, post it to everybody set your settings on everyone and then to the amazing panel i just want to invite everybody to to um to share something that you've thought about sharing maybe didn't share not sure if you should share but that you think actually inside of you would actually contribute to the conversation, if there's anything like that, or just something you didn't have time to say. How to move from fear to trust in, a, in the moment that it shows up. Um, yeah. Question about Kabbana and Amuna, are they the fire in the mitzvahs and Torah water and unification? Anything else, you guys? I know there was something about women, which I didn't. It was way, way back. So I don't remember what the question was. I know people have several mm -hmm. times asked about so reincarnation and women or just reincarnation. Somebody, uh, several people, both on and offline, asked about simple, simple practical tools. What are the some simple practical tools that will actually make a difference? Okay. Well, the problem is that, that question is very often asked to me. Rabbi, can you give me something practical? My, my practical advice is go as high as you can above practicality. To understand the concepts involved, to feel them, to want them, to desire them, to work on those inner levels, and then come back into your life. That's, that's what I call practical. It's not, there's no... Then, then you will be told from within, this is what I need to do. You'll have, you'll have connected to your intuition. You'll have connected to, to your mission, to your destiny. So yeah. practical is, is, of course, there are basics of life, and we want to we, we move on those levels, but you get the inspiration for them, and the ability, the power to do them from that inner experience, which is not practical, in, if you want to define it, like, but it's the most practical. Yeah. I actually, yeah, I find that I, that resonates a lot for me. I think that we, we, when we make the inner connection to the deepest part of ourselves, that's when things get much, can really go all the way down to the ground. How much more practical can you get? <laughs> um, okay, we all uh, that question on the table. Next question on the table. Also, we all want Giula, but how can we make it happen now? That's in all caps. Yes, inner and personal good is essential. Then what? Three question marks. <laughs> that's a person oh. after my own heart. <laughs> I'll throw in a suggestion, if I may, since, uh, sure. you know, they say it in, uh, in business, they say, if you can't envision it, it won't happen. On a very practical level, we need to, for ourselves and for our families, and even our little children, to make it a uh, daily habit, an exercise, to just envision what would your life look like? What would your home look like? What would your workplace look like? if the Gaula were here right now? I right. find that many people can't answer that question. When I was a child, they told us ice cream will grow on trees. Okay, maybe, maybe not, I don't know. But the bottom line is if you can't envision it, and then you have people practically speak about, once you envision it, like what would your room look like? And then you can act toward it. You have a goal to reach. You know, obviously everyone will say, well, it'll be a world where we'll be nice to each other a world where there won't be jealousy, as the Rambam Maimonides writes, there won't be war. So how do you implement that in your own personal life? We don't have, no one's asking us to change the world, change yourself, change your attitude. But if you can envision, will there be birds flying? Will there be a street? Will there be trees? And it's really, to put it in the words, quote the Rebbe, people calling the Rebbe from the Medrash, that Goyla and Geula are exactly the same letters in Hebrew. Goyla meaning exile, Geula meaning redemption. There's only one difference. It's the same world, 
but with an aleph, an aleph that you put into the word goyla, and that creates goula consciousness, which is what? The divine presence within everything. Seeing the divine in everything we do, even in mundane matters, in a dry cleaners, in a restaurant, in an ice cream cone, in a, uh, in a, 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 tra a trip to uh, a vacation. Everywhere there is divine presence. You can identify it and say, why is there this tree? And you say, wow, this tree reminds me of something, a lesson that we learn from it in interconnections or in our connection with God. And everything, and everything we do, you can find godliness. But you have to be conscious and, and be very deliberate about it and teach ourselves and our children to think that way. What will the world look like? And how can I implement it on a daily basis? I'd like to say one thing also, if I may. I, I mentioned bowing before. And bowing, if you bowing is something that we do a number of times each day. We bow to Hashem. We bow the higher part of ourselves down and we stand up. Simple. People do it fast, so fast, it becomes perfunctory. If you slow it down, as I said. I'm bowing my desires to you. I'm bowing my emotions to you. I'm bowing my mind to you. And then Hashem says, now rise up. Now your rising up will no longer be an affront or a rebellion to me. You will be my agent in this world. Being how, you body, how you embody godliness is you know that whatever I can do is because he is allowing me to do it. When somebody says, you're so great, you're the greatest, you just wrote something, you just sang a song, point up. It's him. It's, it's the one above. That's where I got it. Don't give me the, 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 the applause. Because that then becomes, it becomes um, profane. So to keep it holy, continue to give the, the, the credit to where credit is due. The practical way to live a godly life is to do the dishes is to clean the floor, is to do the things that need to be done. But with that consciousness that the rabbi just said, that I'm doing it because Hashem is giving me this to do, and he's giving the ability to do it. So living with that awareness in my life. And I don't say that it touches on the depths. Ani has touched on some depths of the psychological depths of this. But just in there, again, the, the, quest, the, the word has become now practical. What do we do? So this is my way of saying, when it says in the verse, Adonai is okef kifufim, Hashem is the one who straightens up those who are bent. He says, you've bent now, now, you've, you've offered yourself to me, you've given me, and said, now I want that even your standing will be considered an offering to me. And then you, you no longer have a, 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 there's a tension between ego and God, a, a little tension, but it can be lessened by knowing that my ego is given to me in order to serve God. It's, 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 it's like I aligning my will, my own personal will with the divine will. And I get much more out of it because why would I want a, a million dollars when I could ask Hashem's will, which includes every single one of us and all that any of us ever wanted. Mm -hmm. Why would I want only what I want? So it's a win-win when I align myself with his will. And I say, boss, I'm here to serve you service. I want to serve you, and I want to serve your people. I want to serve mankind. I want to serve my family. I want to be of service. If I've done something wrong, and you know what it's like, then I meet somebody who's done something wrong, and I can, I, I can help them from that place because I know what it's like. That's why we've done wrong, because when we went that, that person who we meet who did that and who doesn't know how to get out of his own darkness, yeah, I'm there for you because I know what it's like. So service to know that everything we've ever gone through is in order to serve. That's as practical as I know. <laughs> okay. That's what it's like to be practical in Jerusalem. <laughs> to, share, to share just a little, this year on our Mashiach uh, Suda. Mashiach Suda is a uh, custom that was uh, comes already back from the days of the Holy Baal Shem Tov and then became more and more crystallized through the years. So that in the end of Passover, at the end of Pesach, we make a special meal. We drink four cups of wine and we're connecting on the deepest level. It's the highest level of connection to Mashiach. Mashiach Suda. So I suggested then to my community, 
that in order to start living in Mashiach, and we're talking about changing our mindset and so on and so forth, um, and as mentioned, Mashiach is Yechida, but Yechida is higher than time and space. The whole point over here is to bring it into vessels, to bring it into time and space, is to um, make it our an exercise in 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 in, in giving you in in doing what's called the Geula moment. They call it my Mashiach minute, or my Geula moment, or my Mashiach period of time. I suggested to all the people that were here that we start. You pick a, a, a slot of time. Uh, and you can, it best would be if you set it up, that should be a certain time in your day that you know your, your alarm is going to ring. It's going to be a reminder. It has to be then. But even if not, at least it gets done throughout the day in which you separate, you start off not with a lot. You take two minutes and you make this a, a practice every single day, like Rabbi Jacobson has been mentioning, that in those two minutes, you're living literally as you're going to live in the days of Mashiach. You know, Mashiach came totally revealed yesterday. Today's a day after. Now, these two minutes, there's no darkness in my life. There's just pure godliness, and I'm totally in sync with the divine. So now at this time, I can think what my experience would be in that state right now. So it can come in all different ways. And I, I was doing, I have to admit that I, 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 we made a, a Google spreadsheet and people signed on. I, I managed to keep it for about 15, 15, 20 days. I thought I would manage to keep it throughout the year is that you know, I was lacking the discipline, but it was fantastic while I was doing it. And I want to start doing it again today. And I'm happy this is going on because it gives me the inspiration to go because I'm keep on thinking, why did I drop that? So look at the things that you do, that you, 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 you take something, you want to go for it. But it was so special because it was, I was doing five minutes a day. And then, and then um, I was, the, the idea was that I would increase every month, another minute. So hopefully by the end of the year, you know, it would be already a 10, 15 minute, you know, um, um, chunk in the day. And where Mashiach is, is very real to me right now in my world. And I'm living Mashiach. So either it can be that when Mashiach comes, we will be immersed in Torah. But in a way that in those 15 minutes, literally, it's not like I'm, I can't be distracted by anything else. It's a time that there is no concern in my life. I'm just learning Torah. Or it can be. When Mashiach is here, I was once sitting in a hotel and I was looking outside. It was I got away with my wife for two days after Pesach. It was in Marina del Rey and we were full of sailboats. And I was just sitting there. This was my Mashiach three minutes. I'm looking at the sky and looking at the water and looking at this whole situation. And, and, and what is this? What is the godly content of this experience in the days of Mashiach? How will I see it from the very my physical observation of it? How godly will that be? So if we can't click into Mashiach mode 24-7, we start with a small little piece of the day and increase that slowly and slowly. And for me, we're, I'm going to re, 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 reconnect to that from today, Bezos Hashem, let's make my second attempt <laughs> to get back onto it because it was really special while it was happening. It's a good idea for, for everybody to join. Maybe you set up a, a, a place where people can, can kind of like, it, it helps when we do things Together, people register, they're doing their, their, their Mashiach minute, the Mashiach moment, whatever it is, two, three minutes a day. It's beautiful. Somebody suggested that we do that right now. If everybody would be into that, just like for a minute or two. Yes, no? You guys want to do a Mashiach moment? Okay, so do you want to lead that, Rabbi Wolf? Just, I mean, you already explained it, but maybe just get people in the space for a minute. So what will the human face look to us after Mashiach is here? In which we recognize that, like in Hasidus, it says that the, the, um, the, the Hashem, Hashem's, uh, the, the Yudke Vavke, uh, which is the tetragrammaton, the highest level of divine revelation, is actually expressed in the, in the physical body, in the human body. So the Yud is the head, the hay, it's, it's in the Hasidus, it gives different explanations. The hay are, the, are the, 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 the five fingers. And then the, 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 the body, the vav is the, is the body. And the hay, the second hay are the toes. So that's one explanation given in certain places. Other times it's explained a little differently. So when you're looking at another human being, you're actually, Rabbi Satan has been talking about, like Hashem is now coming through you. So if we can sit for two minutes and just 
um, we're, we're looking at each other and not see just the physical shell, but to see that this is yut ke vavke. It says Mashiach will come. We will say the, the angels will, um, the, the name of the Jewish people will be yut ke vavke. Uh, Mashiach Tzedkenu himself for sure, it says is yut ke vavke, but even, and the angels will say, holy, holy, holy. So if we can suddenly look past all the flaws or whatever it is that we see in other humans and see the divine flow, and that would be a, 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 a minute to dwell on that, perhaps. Okay, so At this moment we're talking to each other. Let's you, just you do can, that. You, you fill that moment with love for each other because the, the verse says, You shall love your friend as yourself. I am God. And what is it that you love in each other? You love the I God, I am God, and the other. The infiniteness in each one of us. And that unites all of us in something much greater than any of us alone can. So add that into this mix that it's a moment of a moment in eternity, a Mashiach moment in which the love that binds us all to one great temple of godliness so that his presence can dwell among us in the way that he really truly wants it. Yeah, yes. The one, one last piece, I just want to repeat what, what Rabbi Wolf said, um, a, a moment of no concern, no concerns. I think that's the essence of it. I think if we had no concerns or complete trust and then we're automatically in complete love and so if we can just, I, I just will just have, I'll time it, a, a moment of everybody doing this in your own space with all of us together. One minute. Bring on my timer. Okay, that was a Mashiach minute. And I just kept, I, I'm, I'm thinking if every, you know, if, if, if everybody would just take on just to share something from this with one person, the idea of the Mashiach minute is fantastic. You now, how do you want to see the world? And I, I just, I'm just seeing how easy it would be if everybody just becomes a little bit of a generator and not just a receiver, just a little bit, receive and then generate, you know, we're one circuit, how long would it take? No time at all. So everybody is here for that purpose. And um, if there are more questions, I don't want. I want to honor everybody's time. So I'm going to just give the speakers a, one last chance to share anything that hasn't been shared, and then we'll conclude for today. the The recordings of this call, as well as all the other summit calls, will be up through Tishavov. So um, ask your local Orthodox rabbi if you have questions about the parameters of listening. And also one other thing, I, I've just loosely seen this going on in the chat. Um, and that is that there are some ex-Christians, probably quite a few of them. And um, I know that Yasha is inviting people to connect with her. And I know Yasha personally very well. She's one of my students. So if, if there's a group of people who would like guidance, help, you know, to, to figure out if you get together and you want to know more about what you can do, you know the issue from the inside, the issues from the inside, and I, I will be very happy to get help for you, uh, including all these people here I'm positive are completely willing to support. So, um, yeah, so that's an important, that's a very important initiative because there are few of us and lots of you, and we're all meant to be in it together. In, in, uh, okay, in, you in, understand? In, in humility, that when something powerful like this is happening for, for us, we should know, I think we can believe that something powerful is happening 
equally powerful for many people in different places. Hashem mm. works like that. That's like the idea of giving two people a Nobel Prize when they didn't even know about each other. Right. So this, is, this is happening in pockets all over the world. And we are adding to that and becoming part of something greater. That's, that is really, that takes the, the, the spotlight off us. Right. Sense of saying, who are we? We just want to be part of something greater, Hashem, that you're doing in the world. That's all we want to do. Please allow us to be part of that. Amen. 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 Okay, Ani, do you want to jump in first with our final round? Sure, sure. So the Mashiach Minute is is so incredible, and it gives people a, an entry point into plugging into getting a DAS, feeling experientially that reality. And what I think is really important for people to know is that there's no blockages to that becoming your baseline. The Rebbe told us, he gives Mangulashem, the, the Geula is here. The pashtos in a simple sense, and it's our job to agree to that. Not just to say like, yes, lip service, yes, Google is here, but like, whoa, I'm gonna, sh- I need to shift my operating system. So to understand, we're not waiting for something external to happen. I'm not waiting for things to evolve to the point that I can see Mashiach with my physical eyes to know that that energy that I'm plugging into in my Mashiach minute can become my baseline consciousness. We don't have to. We don't have to hold ourselves back from what we can heal, what we can clear, what we can accomplish now out of the belief that it will be different when I can see Michelle with my physical eyes or the base on Mikdash has been built. There is no limit to what in this moment and as I take steps from moment to moment, I can heal, I can accomplish, I can achieve spiritually with what I'm able to perceive in the world, what I can release from myself, what I can accomplish. It's all available to us now. So it's really helpful, I found, to speak about Gula in the present tense, because yes, there are manifestations that we are that we have not experienced yet, but none of that holds us back from full force stepping into the next version of myself, the Gula version of myself. And how does that happen on a very practical level? It is really human healing work. And, and Hashem has put so many incredible healing tools in this world that when I'm sitting with my Mashiach minute or my Gula vision, When I feel resistance to it, there's no, it's not, there's no way that's real. I could never have that type of a relationship with someone or the worst. This is just the way I am. Um, We know that, okay, great. So that's coming from my human. That's coming from my wounded human. So I have so many tools and modalities that are kosher available to me to shift that resistance and let that higher, that higher potential in now. So a lot of people are asking how, how, how it really is. What's my Mashiach minute? What's my good rule of vision? And where is my resistance to that? Or where, where, where am I out of sync with that in my baseline consciousness? And I can use these healing tools that Hashem has put in the world to actually access the good reality. So the one thing I want to leave people with is we are not limited. We don't have to wait for any external revelation for us to really step into it. In fact, it's us seriously stepping into it fully. That's going to trigger those external revelations. Thank you. Rabbi Jacobson, would you like to go next? Thank you for that. I concur and I second everything you just said. Well said. I like to use a cliche. (laughs) I know we don't like cliches, but uh, not all cliches are bad. You're either part of the problem or you're part of the solution. Why am I saying that? Is because sometimes we need stark terms, even though we know life is gray, there's not black and white. But to be frank, in this world, you could see yourself, are you part of the problem or part of the solution? And if somebody says, I'm undecided, I'm not sure, you can rest assured it's probably part of the problem. What I mean by that is really an empowerment message. And that is that you are really part of the solution if you wish to be so. And if you don't wish, you become part of the problem. And what does that mean? That means you have within you everything you need to overcome any challenge. Right, I'll see some of the same. And uh, and therefore, it's just a matter of accessing your inner beauty, your inner music. I always love to use the analogy of music that we are all indispensable musical notes in God's divine symphony. 
and each of us has something very unique, our song to sing. So ask yourself this question every day. Are you singing your song or are you copying someone else's mm -hmm. or are you afraid to express yourself? And find the right people who empower you, not people who throw cold water and say, no, you can't do this, you can't do that. We have too many of naysayers that just affirm our own self, uh, low self-esteem and low self-confidence. It's critical to be a people who are forward thinking, which is another way of saying then Gu'ula thinking. Because right. remember, Gu'ula is not just some mystical, mysterious event. It's essentially the natural process. It's a natural, the best that you can be, the best this world can be. Many people think, okay, the world is one way and the Gu'ula will save us. The truth is the world is always meant to be a beautiful garden. It's just gotten concealed. It's covered up by dust. It's, we're blinded because of our own myopic vision. So it's really about the emergence of a reality of the beauty of the music, of the flower, of the, any analogy you'd like to use of the true nature of who you are what you're really capable of being. And asking yourself the question is not what you are right now, what are you capable of? And then live up to it. Every day when you say Moda'ani, we spoke about in the morning, think about your neshama, talk about Mashiach moment, that's your soul. Your soul is your driving force. Your body is your vehicle. And ask yourself, how am I going to use my vehicle today? My body and my bodily needs and my bodily activities. How's that vehicle gonna carry my soul to people? to other encounters, and allow your neshama to be the driving force, the light that illuminates everything within you. And when you do that, you become part of the solution, as opposed to just the status quo, which unfortunately many of us gravitate to, where we just become creatures of habit and routine. And we can do it. There's no question we can do it. The resistance is only your own will. That's the only resistance. We are no longer living under Nazis, Yamach Shemam, or others that are stopping us. You really can do anything you wish in your own spiritual growth, in your own personal growth, in your own influence and education of yourself and your children and your surroundings. And may this summit actually be maybe the last step that finally pushes us over the finish line and the Geula even before Tisha B'Av. And we have the transformation of these days. Transformation, not just the elimination, the transformation of the negative energy into positive energy with the Geula which is goyla into gu'ula, just with that aleph that we need. Amen. Amen. Okay. Rabbi Wolf? Sheikh, now. <laughs> Amen. Let's, let's do it. Let's just do it. Let's live it. I like that. I like the idea that it, it, I think so many of people get stuck in it, that when Mashiach will come, when Mashiach will come, and, and the notion that... Uh, that 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 it, it's more than he needs a oimedache kaslenu. It's it's more than he's standing behind our wall. Uh, there's no more wall anymore. He's just here. It's just it's just, it's just becoming, you know, just just agreeing, as was said before, agreeing that that's the way it is, and and then then just allowing that MS to flow through ourselves, and through in our life, and at every moment doesn't make a difference if you if which. You know, sometimes we, we slip and we fall into some dark, dark spot. The good news is that 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 is today's days that is so empty and so unreal that you can so instantly on the second pop back into reality because Mashiach is reality now. It's not like it used to be when Mashiach was distant. And right. here, it is the reality. It is, it is the truth of, of, of where we are already. And it's just to stop being distracted and to just, you know, synchronize with what is, with what is now. Yes, amen, thank you. Just in case anybody wonders, Ani's camera went off and she can't get it to go back on yet. Yeah, I'm sorry, everybody. <laughs> there must, I just thought there must be too much light coming from my face right now, just broke, couldn't handle it. Um, Rabbi Sutton. Rabbi Jacobson's brother, during the summit, brought the verse from the beginning of Genesis that um, there was um, turmoil, there's turmoil and emptiness on the face of the waters, on the face of the depth, and the spirit of Hashem 
Ruach Elohim Merachevet al Alpeniyamayim was hovering over the waters, and the rabbis say that that's the Ruach Shel Mashiach, Ruach Shel Melech Mashiach, the spirit of the of the of the Messiah King, meaning to say that Hashem, part of the program of this world of the six thousand years of this world, is the, the, it's guided by and towards the Messianic age. It cannot but conclude and consummate in anything else but a messianic age, the perfection of, of, of physical existence uh, and, and the transition into higher and higher worlds, the return to the, there's no end to what, to what Hashem has in store for us. But he came and he brought us down into this stage, this stage of human existence, the drama of human history where everything is hidden from us. And it's possible for people to think that they can do whatever they want. When you look at the world from the heavenly point of view, the higher worlds preceded our world. We are the last. We don't have to wait for the next world to exist. It pre-existed our world. What's called Olam Abba. The next world, the world of eternity. The consciousness of eternity is only hidden from us. It is not that it doesn't exist. The context within which we exist is eternity. That consciousness is impacting on us now. It's telling us, open yourself up to the bigger picture of what God is doing in this world, why we all came to this world at this time. is to be part of something awesome that our souls were told about it before we were born. Are you ready to go down? It will be hard, but this is going to be the ultimate celebration of all the history of mankind in one generation. You all will be there. The good, the evil, the bad, the ugly, all of you will have to be there. Everybody will have to face judgment, but there's mercy in the judgment. And there's much, much mercy if a person wakes now and says, I want to make my life better. I want to live my life according to God's plan. So bless everybody, bless all of us that we can be worthy, privileged. Who knows if we're worthy, but to be privileged, to be part of this awesome story that is capping now, that's peaking now, that's, that we're part of. We can't not be part of it, but to know how the good ending is so much greater than any of us have ever imagined. May we see it now, just now. All right. Thank you to everybody. Thank you to the listeners that have shown up for so many things and that are sharing with your friends. Please keep doing that. That is something everyone can do that will make a huge difference. Everyone is a world and connected to worlds spiritually, energetically, and actually physically. So especially now. So please start there and be yourself and you're the deeper versions. Thank you to the speakers. <laughs> Thank you for saying yes. Thank you for being here for the whole thing. Thank you for sharing from such an authentic place. And I know that there's, like I said in the beginning, each one of you could stand up on a stage and probably talk for several years and not even run out of thoughts. Um, but, and material to give over, but this is very, very valuable. And it's very valuable to, for people to see that there is more than one perspective on the truth that we are all connecting to. And all these perspectives just help us see that it's bigger than anything. So thank you for that as well. All right. To be continued, everybody. Great to meet all of you. Thank you so much. It was an honor. Really an honor. Really an honor. Really an honor. Thank you. Bless you. Thanks so much for this. Thank you, Esha. Thank you, Shifra. You should meet in Yerushalayim today. Amen. 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 David, do you want to unmute the lines just so people can say bye? Is that hard? I haven't done that for years. No, give it 10 seconds, five seconds. Nope. No, I can't. Okay. <laughs> okay, for next time. All right, take care, everybody.